Okay, good evening. Tonight, we welcome you to the Trumbull Board of Education regular meeting, Tuesday, July 14th, 2020, 7 p.m. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for the liberty and justice for all. thing I want to say is I want to thank all of you, Bill Chin, Jeff Hackett, Christina Heffley, for helping set up this meeting for us so that I particularly am the one that doesn't have to worry about the computer anymore. And thank you very much. I appreciate it. Okay, our first order of business is a recognition, the 2020 School-Based Teachers of the Year. Dr. Butt. Well, it was a very important time this year to recognize the teachers who have given so much of themselves, not just like in every year, but particularly in this year, given the challenges of COVID-19. And we had the opportunity as usual to participate in a robust based process for those teachers of the year. Uh, we opened it up this year online for uh, completion uh, of nominations by staff members, as well as parents. So we had many, many teachers recognized, nominated, and these 10 are the school-based winners. The district winner of the Teacher of the Year competition will be announced uh, at the beginning of the next school year in August. But all 10 of these uh, recipients, who I believe are watching virtually tonight, uh, are very, very worthy of the board's honor. Thank you. Thank you very much. And if it's okay with you, Dr. Budd, I will read them. Is that right with you? Perfect. Okay. First of all, congratulations on behalf of the Board of Ed. Um, we're very proud of you. From the Tech Ed Building, Rachel Orr. From Booth Hill School, Kimberly Greco. From Daniels Farm School, Michael McGrath. From Frenchtown, Remy Grinnell. From Jane Ryan, Samantha Stebbins. From Middlebrook, Kelly Janan. From Tashua, Shannon Lynch. From Hillcrest, Dawn Fermanek. From Madison, Elizabeth Doherty. And from Trumbull High School, Sarah Scrofani. Congratulations. In addition, this year we were very pleased to participate in a relatively new program from the State Department of Education that recognizes paraprofessionals, paraeducators. It's the Anne Marie Murphy Memorial uh, Program, which recognizes a very important paraeducator uh, who perished in Sandy Hook. Uh, but again, we took nominations from across our schools, uh, had many, many nominations of paraeducators, and I'm really pleased to represent these 10 as the school-based winners, and again, the district-based winner will be announced at the beginning of the next school year. Okay, thank you very much. And I'd like to read these names of the school-based paraeducators of the year 2020. From Tech Act, Marjorie Dennis. From Booth Hill, Lillian Hanna. Daniels Farm, Caroline Bonazzo. Frenchtown, Allison Carpenter. Jane Ryan, Gail Dorsch. Middlebrook, Marianne Daly. Tashua, Kim Piccolo. Hillcrest, Lori O'Brien. Madison, Lorna Weinstein. And Trumbull High, Blanca Meses. Congratulations to all. It's important, finally, I agree. Not only are these 20 fantastic teachers and paraeducators, but they represent hundreds of their colleagues in both categories who have gone truly above and beyond this particular year. So it's a very great recognition program. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, next is uh, Mrs. Norcell, correspondent. Since our last regular meeting, we have had two special meetings. And tonight I will report on all the emails that pertain to topics that are now important and in the eyes. Uh, we had emails concerning the reopening committee, the uh, slow response to parents getting answers about the reopening, on um, the survey to parents. Uh, all these people would appreciate more information, more uh, specifics. And we got letters from Jennifer Crawford, Allison Valance, Clara Laporte, Elena Veltri, Patricia Kelly, Michelle Hyland, and Eleanor Mislip. 
We also had parents who uh, opposed their st children wearing masks in school. We have Fisa Cruzbull, Joanna Mechuis, Jamie Mulgaard, and Christian Sabad. Uh, Ava Gallo and uh, Rachel Troop and Janella Perez uh, sent us a copy of their report and their survey results entitled Anti Bias and Equity of the Alumni High School Thoughts. Uh, Matt Berzakrik will read into the minutes tonight a statement endorsed by the TEA and PTSA to create an anti racist learning community. John Mastroni sent us an invitation to reach out if we have any questions or comments about the TEA climate survey. And uh, we, the board, received a thank you from Jennifer Charles, who is uh, leaving Trumbull to become a principal of a, a school. And she sent a thank you for her wonderful five years working with the staff, students, and community at Trumbull High School. That's our communications tonight. Thank you very much. Okay, as we move on, as public comment. Okay, our first person for public comment is Ava Gallo. Hi, uh, can you hear me all right? Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. Uh, hi all, my name is Ava Gallo and I am a 2016 graduate of Trumbull High School. In this moment of racial reckoning, I have been inspired to take a more critical lens on our education system here in Trumbull. We as residents of, pri of a primarily white wealthy suburb in Connecticut have a responsibility to grow and strive to be better informed citizens who embody the ideals of a democratic, diverse and global society as referenced in Superintendent Isagna's statement to the Trumbull community. In response to this moment, Rachel Tropp and I have conducted a survey for Trumbull alumni inquiring about what they felt was missing or taught incorrectly from their experience in our school system and asking if they had witnessed or experienced a racially charged incident or microaggression. Rachel will get more into the details of the report during her time with public comment, but is it, important, it is important to note that out of over 160 respondents, all but three felt there was something missing or mistaught from their experience, and over 60 reported witnessing or experiencing acts of racism at school. In response to an overwhelmingly overwhelming majority of opinion of the alumni surveyed, it is imperative that our school system takes a holistic review of all aspects of our education with an eye for bias and inclusion. We propose a school-based, racially diverse committee consisting of administrators, principals, teachers, parents, and students to evaluate our school system on at least seven criteria, including curriculum, professional de development, community partnerships, and workforce and talent management. A similar committee was developed in the past two years at Southington, a school district with comparable demographics to Trumbull. Out of that committee was born a comprehensive action plan that gave specific recommendations with metrics and dates and responsible parties. This type of committee has been presented to and supported by the superintendent, the assistant superintendent, members of the Board of Education, several members of town council, and our first selectman, Vicki Tesoro. Other towns all over the state of Connecticut and across the nation have put into place similar committees with similar charges. Why should Trumbull be any different? Trumbull has had very successful cultural programs in the past that were revered by students in the survey. But if anything has become clear during this period of time is that we can and we must do better. Teachers, parents, alumni, and current students have all expressed concerns publicly about the diversity of voice in our curriculum and our schools. It is time to listen. Thank you for your time. Thank you very Thank much. You. Our next speaker is Matt Brassia. Good evening. After the events in May, which sparked worldwide protests of pre police brutality and calls to end systemic racism, Superintendent Ayasagna released a statement to the Trumbull community reiterating the ideals of a democratic, diverse, and global society demand that we condemn violence and encourage appropriate civil discourse. We will continue to aim the, toward these ideals in our school system, as racism in any way, shape, or form has no place in the Trumbull public schools. Before we can teach our students how to change the, the way they see the world, we as teachers acknowledge that we have to educate ourselves first and then create the environment where our students feel safe as we build an anti-racist community together. 
in order to facilitate the necessary discussions, teachers with teachers, teachers with students, students with students, and in conjunction with the current Board of Education policies, we're calling on the district to take the following steps. Number one, work with teachers on the PDEC to provide mandatory high quality, meaningful professional development on implicit bias, restorative discipline, and anti-racist training for teachers, administrators, and members of the Board of Education. Two, conduct an immediate review of K through 12 curriculum to ensure that there is a diversity of voices and teaching methods which reflect and reinforce anti-racism. Three, ensure that the text, the text selection process is free from implicit bias and embodies anti-racist principles. Four, conduct an immediate review of all discipline policies to ensure that they do not unduly affect any minority group, including zero tolerance policies. In addition, conduct an audit of hiring practices and create an active outreach program designed to recruit more teachers of color. Also, create clubs and student communities, which provide spaces for students to engage with students with subjects impacting minority and underrepresented groups. Also, establish a steering committee made up of Board of Ed, Long Hill Administration, Building Administration, teachers, students, and other community members who will develop a comprehensive plan for updating our schools and policies with regards to anti-racism and implicit bias. Establish a plan for redistricting our elementary schools with an eye towards racial and economic diversity. And finally, establish a civil rights committee made up of students, teachers, and administration, administration who will be responsible for receiving and investigating complaints of discrimination and harassment, as well as monitor the impact of the curriculum and the policies on the TPS community. And in the document that you have, you all the, um, all the Board of Ed policies are referenced there. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next is Rachel Traub. Hi, good evening. Uh, thank you for your attention tonight. Uh, my name is Rachel Traub, and like Ava, I'm a, class of, a member of the THS class of 2016 and a recent graduate from Harvard. As Ava mentioned earlier, we've been excited to engage with members of the school administration and Board of Ed, and we have um, in this national moment of reckoning, and um, we're hopeful about making Stumble Schools even better. We've written and provided to you a report which includes over 160 alumni voices addressing concerns spanning from improving and expanding curricular options, to creating a more inclusive and respectful environment, the latter concern driven by the over 80 reported incidents of racial stereotyping, harassment, or discrimination experienced in just this small subset of alumni alone. Though we acknowledge the many positive experiences Trumbull Public Schools works to provide for its students, there's always room for improvement and our report suggests a set of places to start. Our students aren't served when they graduate without an adequate knowledge of their country and their world. Over 150 alumni of the sample we reached alone expressed that they know little to nothing about Africa, Asia, South America, or the Middle East. They learned little about Black history in America between the Civil War and the Civil Rights Movement and never learned about the reign of racial terrorism, lynching, and destruction that characterized the intervening years. They didn't learn an adequate amount about the systemic oppression of indigenous people and racial minorities or anything much past, post, uh, past 1945. These students went to college and were blindsided by concepts like colonialism and imperialism. They didn't understand and couldn't engage with arguments about political and economic systems like capitalism, socialism, communism, and fascism. And they weren't prepared for conversations they needed to have in the college classroom and as citizens entering the voting booth and debating issues in the public sphere. And the issue remains that five out of six high school students never take another history class after high school. So the few who could later correct their gaps in learning are in the minority. Um, we're grateful to those of you who've read our report and eager to engage in discussion and address concerns or questions that you may have as you process the results. Um, and to this end, we're extremely excited and hopeful about the potential for a committee within the BOE to study these problems and to work to make our schools more inclusive, to make our curriculum more diverse, and to successfully create the foundations for Trumbull citizens to live lives as global citizens and leaders, especially as they exit the bubble that is our town and must grapple with the complicated, diverse, and divided world that we live in. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ashley Guardiano. Well, Madam Chair, it doesn't appear that Ms. Guardiano is on or the next speaker, Ms. Thomas. Oh, okay. So. Um, our next speaker is Lindsay Thomas. Uh, Ms. Thomas doesn't appear to be on. If she is, or Ms. Guardiano, please press the raise hand button. We can move on to the next speaker. The next person to speak is Tara Figueroa. Tara Figueroa, please. Hi there, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Hi, good evening. 
This is Tara Figueroa. I reside at 105 Grove Street here in Trumbull. I am a mom to two children, one of who attends Middlebrook. Um, I'm speaking tonight in support of the Diversity and Inclusion Committee that some of the other members in our community have already been discussing. Um, the points that I wanna raise are just mainly around the fact that this isn't something that's new or something that I think, you know, is, an, is a point to be disagreed, right? I feel like we're all on the same page. Um, the Trumbull public school system in itself already, already you know, states that it strives to meet the educational needs of all students within a challenging and supportive academic environment that empowers each student to become a lifelong learner and to live and participate in a di democratic, diverse, and global society. What we're talking about is raising global citizens, right? Children that are able to be in a world that is increasingly more diverse than it always has been. Um, many of the things that are being called for are already in step with Trumbull Public Schools policies when it comes to diversity, when it comes to um, inclusion, as well as its racial, um, racial policies that are in place. So it's more a matter, I think, of just making sure that we're actually looking at these things in a way that affects minorities and affects non-minorities as well, because it's a great learning experience um, for everyone, all students and teachers to feel supported. Um, you know, the last point I wanted to make was around not just the fact that this is already is within the Trumbull Public Schools policy, but you know, also just taking a step back and realizing, you know, not just at the high school level, but also, you know, middle school, elementary school, that these things are absolutely important and possible. Um, I know that the, the school system, our BOE, you know, is, is under a lot of scrutiny when it comes to budget. And I, I really do see these things as mutually exclusive. I do feel like we can make progress when it comes to the way that we think about curriculum. Um, you know, my daughter, you know, she she's comes from two different worlds. You know, she's Filipina, she's Puerto Rican, and she lives in a very, um, where the majority is white. And, you know, I, I, thank you so much. Yeah, no, I just, I just wanted to stress the importance of diversity. And, you know, again, also on our BOE as well, if we can also work towards, you know, not just having more diversity in the classrooms, but in the BOE as well. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, our next speaker is Joy Colon. Uh, Madam Speaker, uh, Madam Chairman, uh, Ashley Galliano is here. I'll bring in Ms. Colon. Okay, bring her in. Bring Ashley Galliano. Madam Speaker, go ahead. Okay. Hello, everyone. Apologies, internet problems here with the storm. Um, Ashley Gadiano, 56 Frederick Street. Um, um, I just wanted to hop on and first thank you all for uh, the diversity being proposed. Um, as many of you know, I organized a peaceful event in response to Mr. Floyd's death and most recently put forth a resolution forming an equity, diversity, and inclusion task force in Trumbull via the town council. Um, ensuring that our approach to diversity in the town of Trumbull is holistic and it spans the entire town is critical. That includes what we do in our public schools. Um, we have to have sh teachers that are diverse. We need to make sure that our recruitment policies and the tone and tenor of our town systems are inclusive. Um, you know, I have, like I said, two young children in the elementary schools. So from a very young age, we need to make sure that we teach about diversity, um, not just through curriculum changes at the middle and high school level, but also at the curriculum um, in the elementary school system. Uh, finally, we really need to look at our policies uh, on the Board of Ed and in the Trumbull Public Schools through the lens of anti-racism and revise them with all of the key stakeholders at the table. And I know 
that there's proposals for some great groups of individuals to join. Um, and I hope that those conversations are continued. Uh, finally, when I spoke with a group of college students last week about how to ensure that they live and work in Connecticut post-graduation, a culture of diversity and inclusion were at the top of, of their list. So not only do these policies make sense as we send our children into a global world, they also make sense as we talk about the vitality and vibrancy of Connecticut. So I know that I will be involved. I look forward to working with uh, both the board, the new Central Public School System on all of these initiatives. It's your meeting. Thank you very much. Our, our next speaker, um, Bill Chin, do you want to tell me who our next speaker is going to be? Is it going to be Lissy Thomas or do I go to Joey Cologne? Sure. Miss um, Thomas is still not here yet, I don't believe. So we'll continue with Miss Cologne. Okay. We'll vote at the beginning of Ms. Cologne. Joy Cologne, please. Hi there, Joy Cologne, 5452 Main Street. Um, as you may know, I'm a citizen of Trumbull, a mom to three boys, an educator, and member of town council. Tonight, I am here as Joy, your neighbor. Thank you to all neighbors here tonight, on the BOE as well as in the audience. Um, an equitable education system helps all students develop the knowledge and skills they need to be engaged and become productive members of society. More importantly, giving all children an equitable start would lead to better economic and social outcomes for individuals, communities, Trumbull, and for our nation. Civil discourse is the only way forward. This initiative sets forth a plan for all because we all need this. Consideration of all citizens is important in this process. If Trumbull Public Schools continues to be equitably driven and develop safe spaces for difference of various kinds of learners, Anti-bias will be the outcome. Anti-racism will be the outcome. Acceptance and celebration will be the outcome. This is a moral imperative and we must invest the time and commitment to this endeavor. I support this initiative and I thank the people who put it together. Thank you very much. Our next person is Amanda Wagner. Hi everyone, can you hear and see me? Perfect, great. <laughs> With technology, I always like to double check. <laughs> So uh, my name is Amanda Wagner. Um, I live at 43 Beach Street and I'm a resident of Trumbull since 2018, but I've been in the surrounding area since about 2015. Professionally, I received a master's of um, higher education um, administration from Syracuse University, which allowed me to focus a lot on identity development um, throughout the stages of life. I learned through that program the importance of diversity and how it plays a huge role for human development as long as young as a few months old. I used most of my graduate program to explore the development of college age students, but when I became a, pregnant with my now three year old daughter, time flies, um, I began to realize that all those lessons are extremely important in how I want to raise my family. Um, when looking into the changes being proposed for the Trumbull Public Schools Against Racism, I was thrilled to see that it wasn't just jump in and teach students about discrimination or throwing around fancy words that students might not understand, such as equity, anti-racism. These changes are looking to better prepare our teachers who are the role models for our children to better understand their own identities, their own biases, privileges, and to utilize their new knowledge to help and support our children in our community. It also talks about analyzing our curriculum for inclusivity and anti-racism principles, um, which we're not looking to take out parts of our nation's history, right? We are looking to be able to reflect more on the ways that we're describing specific moments in our history, how we glorify some moments without covering others. And that's crucial because we're having missing parts of our history, which as we all know, history can repeat itself. So without covering everything, how are we making that change? Um, we wanna have a full curriculum that truly embodies the diversity within our town and in our country. Um, in addition to having this connection um, to diversity, equity, and inclusion work professionally, um, I previously worked in residential life and higher education where I gained experience about restorative discipline for college students. So when I saw that part about the training for teachers, I thought that was fantastic because previously as a conduct officer, I met with students who violated code of conduct. And I can attest to the benefits and the deeper sense of support and connection to students through this process. It's looking to make a disciplinary situation more educational and reflective, giving students the space to explore why they make decisions, how those decisions impact more than just themselves. This type of discipline has been profound effects on students' development and often leads to smaller percentage of repetitive behavior. 
I really appreciate your time as I described a few um, reasons why I'm in support of these new changes to make our town more reflective of our community and looking to better prepare our children for a brighter future. Thank you. Thank you. All right, our next speaker is Ellie Grasso. Good morning, Hi everyone, thank you. My name is Ellie Grasso. I live at 24 Indian Road. I have three children in the Trumbull Public School System. Um, I also have the interesting perspective of having two biological white children and one adopted brown child. Um, that means that when I am listening to all the previous speakers and am so grateful and proud of our town and the members of our town for putting forth these critically important initiatives, it means that I'm not just interested in teaching my child of color. It is as important to teach our white children in school about our history. And like Joy Cologne said, for me, this is a moral imperative. These are not things that would be nice or interesting. This, this needs to happen because as one of the previous speakers said, if we are not educating our children about true American history, they, they go off into the world and then they're blindsided with the realities that come forth to them. Personally, I do not think that there is ever a time that it is too soon to talk to our children about race. Um, I know that, that some of the curriculum has just changed and, and we've taken, I believe, social studies out of K through five. Maybe that's not happening for a year or so, but as far as I'm concerned, right now we're in a, civil, a, a civic emergency as a result of the lack of American history the good, the bad, and the ugly that has been, um, that, that we've been teaching throughout Trumbull and, and all the schools in the district. I can tell you that my child has had incidences at school with, uh, in her elementary school. And when you, uh, I wanna speak out about professional development and other speakers have said this and how important this is because what happens is if teachers and administrators are not specifically trained in uh, racial issues, it has happened more times that I can count that, that my child and other children that I know of color are told, you didn't hear what you think you heard. I'm sure that's not what he meant. Rather than using it as an opportunity and like a previous speaker said, um, using a, a certain kind of, of justice where you're listening and growing as opposed to punitive. Um, that's what we need to give our children, an opportunity to learn and grow. Otherwise, we are not fulfilling our obligation to teach them about the world and prepare them for the world. So I, I absolutely, there aren't words enough for me to say how much I support these initiatives and how proud I am of the Trumbull teachers and everyone else putting these initiatives forward. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Chelsea Morton. Yes, hello everyone. Um, my name is Chelsea Morton and I'm a rising junior at Trumbull High School. As a person of color in the Trumbull school system, I've always had to experience being the only one. The only one in an honors class, the only one in a club, and sometimes even the only one in my grade. We need to fight to end that only one culture at Trumbull. I hope I am pushing for the Board of Education to push an initiative so that to make it a more welcoming environment for minority students as well as minority teachers who want to apply. You, although although African American history and minority history may be included in some of the curriculum, it needs to be essential. And I, along with the Activism Coalition of Trumbull students, as well as the other Black Lives Matter groups in Trumbull and well, I'm willing to partner with the Board of Education to fight to make African American history, minority history, essential history. It is not history that happened on the side of the main events. Those are the main events because people of color, immigrants, and Jewish people, we have helped to build this country from the ground up. A lack of education can lead to a toxic nationalism. It can lead to people believing that minority lives do not matter, and that can cause trauma to not only minority students, but to other students who have to witness it. I know as I know myself as a minority student in, in the Trumbull school system has had to face an immense amount of trauma, immense amount of trauma, 
and without anything being done about it. So creating a diversity board to look at these crimes, to look at the to look at these acts of hate crimes that have been com that are committed in the Trumbull school system will eventually help protect students of color and make it a more welcoming environment. There is never two sides of it to vote to any to any hate crime. There is never an, a difference in opinion. It is not about political parties and not about any of that. It is about right and wrong and what is morally right and what is morally wrong. So I ask all of you to look at it if that is one of your own nieces and nephews, your own sons and daughters, and look at that if, if you would want them to be treated that way. And I hope that you make African American history, minority history, essential history, because that can save the lives of so many students in this system. And I'm willing to work with you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next one is David Weissman. Okay, hello. Hello. Yep, it says that, that I am un, unmuted by the host. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so, okay. All right, well, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm David Weitzman, I live at 209 Fernwood Road in Trumbull. Uh, I'm also a social worker at Frenchtown School. Uh, last time I made a public comment, it was at a town council budget meeting several weeks ago. I started with a note of thanks to Superintendent Isagna and Associate Superintendent Jonathan Budd for having sent their email regarding the murder of, uh, of George Floyd. And they highlighted um, the public school's promise to condemn violence, racism, and to recommit to the ideals of the Trumbull Public School mission statement. I applauded this message then, I applaud it now. It was important then, it's important now, it'll be important forever. Um, I'm especially proud to be part of the Board of Ed and the broader community as they consider the moral imper imperative of the initiative that's being proposed this evening. I believe we got off to a great start a few, a few weeks ago uh, when first select woman Vicki Tesoro proclaimed June LBGTQ month in, in Trumbull. But now the work has to continue. And I'm glad that it's at the forefront for Trumbull Public Schools. Gandhi said, if we are to reach real peace, we must begin with the children. I could not agree more. So I am a social worker. I devoted my life to the social part of social work, social and emotional learning, social interaction, social equality, equity, social justice. All of the above is related to the mission statement. And all of the above will be proposed by the initiative being spoken about today. This will not happen by accident. If we are going to build a safe anti-racist community, it could only, be back, only happen when actions back up words, where policy supports stated values that we remain committed to supporting and enhancing the dignity of every single human being. However, it is, this is necessary if we are to remain diligent and act with fidelity to the stated mission statement. I call upon the Board of Ed to support in full these initiatives. Now, in closing, I do have a suggestion. My teachers, my parents taught me well that if you're going to identify a challenge, identify at least one solution. So, we are scheduled to go back to school in less than two months. It'll be a time of great anxiety and great uncertainty. Our community needs a message, something for the schools to coalesce around, a sense of cohesion, safety, and belonging. Here's my idea. There are signs around town that state, there are, I will, I'll, I'll be done in just 30 seconds. Thank you very much for the extra time. Uh, there, are town, there are signs around town in red, white, and blue that say hate has no home here. There's nothing controversial about this, nothing partisan, nothing political. I respectfully request that the Board of Ed strongly consider placing one of these signs at the entrance of each school. Its unequivocal message is low cost and sets a tone right out of the gate for students, faculty, as well as the community. It puts into action the spirit of Ralph and Jonathan's email from a few weeks ago, the aim towards the ideals in our school system that racism in any way, shape, or form has no place in Trumbull Public Schools. Thank I you. could not agree more. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Chin, is Lindsay Thomas available? Yes, she is. Okay. Hi, thank you for the time, and I'm uh, 
profusely apologetic for my delay in joining. Um, my name is Liz D. Thomas. I'm from, I live on 99 Aspen Lane. And I wanted to speak today on, uh, in support of the initiative uh, by Trumbull Public Schools to enhance diversity education for teachers, faculty, and, and students uh, in the Trumbull Public Schools. I am an emergency physician in our community and, um, I, and I have lived in Trumbull for over 10 years. And I'm a professor at Quinnipiac, um, where I teach in the medical school. And it is apparent to me consistently through my experiences in Trumbull uh, over the last decade that there is a lot to be done for our community. Um, the disparities that I see consistently in the emergency department, as well as among my students who are training to be physicians in the medical school, um, you know, are, are profound and really something that um, I think many people don't have the vantage point of seeing uh, for disparities in socioeconomic status, of course, between our neighbors um, in Bridgeport and as well as the surrounding towns, as well as, you know, um, lack of opportunity in education. And I think, you know, our schools have much to be done. Um, I grew up as an immigrant in this country, in New York, in a public school system. And I can't tell you that, um, how much less my children are learning in Trumbull Public Schools around some of the concepts that are being raised uh, by everyone who's been speaking, as well as the teachers in this initiative. And it is very important that these messages are taught to our children because um, if not, we are, we are developing a society that um, is really um, disadvantaging, not just those who have the means to succeed, but um, all of us. And so, you know, I think I want to just end with the, the famous quote that talent is universal, but opportunity is not. And we must give our children this vantage point um, of, of diversity training, but also to our teachers. And so I, I want to stand in solidarity for that. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, that is the end of the public comments. Our next item is the superintendent report. Thank you, Mrs. Um, just, I rarely do this, I just want to make one generic comment about all our speakers. Uh, we're very committed, you know, they were right on target. And you know, there's no question about it that uh, the areas that they mentioned have to be addressed. And we will address them. Uh, I committed to the board that when the new superintendent, uh, he or she come on, that I would um, transitionalize with he or she to point out the areas of focus so that we can really hone in and drill down. And my phrase is, the time is right. This, this is a moment in time that we cannot forego and not say, okay, we're gonna get to it. Now's the time, okay? It's happening not only in Trumbull, Connecticut, the United States, all over. And um, we should address it head on, and it's a commitment everybody in our community okay um as far as the superintendent's uh, report that i'll be very brief tonight um i do want to highlight something that uh, we mentioned before but i really think it's important that the board well, i know realizes but also the educational community um they should be very pleased with the financial uh turnaround in the 2000 1920 budget uh, and the 2020-21 request. In the first year, there was a potential, the probability, being $1.2 2 million uh, in short of the deficit. And it concluded with a balance. Okay, Credit goes to the staff, particularly Al Cameron, our own uh, business manager, did a great job working in the business office. <laughs> Really setting the boat in the right direction. And I applaud it out for that. Um, with regard to the coming year, we have balanced out, okay? Although there have been several layoffs and reductions, we know uh, numerous transfers, we are on target for 2021. And the ship is coming back to port, turned around, and now it's uh, docking, okay? We're ready to start the year matter when it uh, begins. Okay. Um, I do want to point out though, 
that the governor and the commissioner have really a lot of time, energy, and effort into getting us ready. Right now, uh, we are scheduled to open on September 1st, 2020. That comes not only from the governor and the commissioner, but also from Secretary DeVos, I didn't know I pronounced the name wrong, um, but uh, they are envisioning live teacher-student relationship like business as usual two years ago. Okay. I don't know if that's going to happen. Uh, I will be very candid with you. Uh, superintendents have talked a lot. That's a monumental task. It's one thing when you close a building or close a district. Teachers don't come to work, students don't come to school, buses don't transport. But when you open up, when you open up, you have 7,000 students. You have 1,000 staff members, okay? You have 32 buses. Things are much more difficult. And right now, we are striving to achieve that quality. In fact, tomorrow, our um, local reopening committee, uh, which has been formed, and uh, they have already met a couple times, mainly through, um, I think it's Google Meets, uh, Jeff. Um, we have 30 individuals selected to be on this committee. There are 13 subcommittees. That gives you an, an idea of the magnitude of the task at hand. And I'll just briefly tell you, uh, for example, we're talking about the key one, the one that Secretary of Education in Washington and Cordona here are talking about is the instruction and learning model. They are proposed. Washington is saying one model, live, as in the past. Connecticut is asking us to come up with three models, the live model that we're used to, okay, virtual learning, distance learning as we had this year, or a hybrid. So our committee will be working on all three. We also have um, an ancillary education program committee, uh, mainly with the um, ancillary courses, uh, fine arts, athletics, career tech education. We also have a key component and really a very difficult one to integrate uh, within two months, and that's in the special ed. Um, you also have to involve families, administrative staff, PTAs. Facilities take a big role in this, and we're fortunate that John Morello, David Irwin, and our custodians and maintenance people are on board with us on this. Um, administrative support, I have Guy Stella and David Irwin focusing on that, both are former superintendents, and uh, they, uh, this is not their first story. They, they know what they're doing and they will set it up in the right way. Technology, Jeff Hackett and um, Chris uh, Effley, transportation, Dwayne Perkins, uh, PPE and health requirements, Lucy Bango, uh, and uh, Megan Murphy, Lynn Steinbreck, uh, and school nurses. In every article you see about coming back, no matter what town it is, they, they point out these are critical people. Those four people I just mentioned, um, because they may be involved in temperature checks, having a student come down. You have to have a special room for any student that has the possibility of being ill. Also, we have to talk about um, nutrition. Will we have lunch as we know it? Will lunch be in a classroom? Will lunch be in a cafeteria or in a gym? Will we provide lunch like we did during the summer for, I think we average 525 lunches per lunch and breakfasts per day? Now you compound that into a lunch program when you have 7,000 our students. You can understand the scope of what we're dealing with. And uh, I think it's important that we realize that and also um, parents uh, realize that too. Now, each group is working on their respective area to give us a draft report tomorrow, okay? Uh, I have been um, in contact with the chairs, not all, but most of them, 
So we'll have a better handle. I'll let the board know in a weekend report. I, um, thanks, Tim. I have a, I have a better handle, and I'll let the board know in a weekend report. Stats. We have to have our draft plan submitted to the state on July 24th. So we meet tomorrow. We get a draft Friday or Monday. We have three days to write the full We've done that just to give you a perspective of uh, how we're going to proceed. I do want to mention uh, some people have asked school offices um, have resumed. Okay, they resume Monday, July 6th. The buildings aren't open yet, but the offices are functioning normally. I also want to point out, um, and it was highlighted by the uh, very well done public comments. Today I met with um, Kathy Urbano, Social Studies Chairman, uh, Department Chairman, and um, many of the curriculum area groups. I think uh, Rachel Trouble and uh, Ava Gallo were on here tonight, and uh, uh, Ashley Medino uh, was here. Um, then we had the other group, the BLM group, that uh, did the protest and everything, which worked out well from what I could gather. And uh, we're going to meet again, okay? Our first area of focus will be curricular, okay? Because we have the summer to do it. But we will be expanding into other areas that they pointed out, cultural diversity, whatever you want to name, okay? We're going to follow their lead. But one of the reasons why we're starting with curriculum first is we already have the model in motion. We have, and what we're going to do is we're going to take one or two students from each committee, have them meet with Kathy Rabano, then she's going to get their input and bring the curriculum to a regular model of staff, Administrators, curriculum committee of the Board of Education, superintendent, and then to the Board of Education. So I don't want you to think we're just focusing in on curriculum. We understand it's not just a curriculum issue. It's a racial issue, it's a diversity issue, it's an opportunity issue, um, but we have to address it. I will say this though, and don't take this as a cop out or down. I don't mean it to be. But it's a reality. When the new superintendent does come on board, okay, there are a lot of areas out there that he or she are going to have to address and address quickly. Uh, this is just one of them. Okay, the COVID naturally is another. So opening of school is another. Okay, um, testing is another. Special ed. So I just want to try to put that in perspective. And lastly, um, oh, I mentioned about changes. Things change every day. So, and this is the biggest, one of the biggest gripes, so to speak, that the superintendents made. Is we'll hear something at one o'clock, get ready on it, staff's working hard, and the next day, or the even that night, it's changed. Things change continuously, either from Washington or from Hartford or from Weathersfield, where the commissioner is, or from the Connecticut State Department of Education. Perfect example. The last year, last year, the state would not budge on reducing the number of school days from 180. They've never done that. I, mean, I can't remember, not 40 years in education. But today, superintendents got a memo. They have budged. Now school districts can have 177 days, not 180. The three days are to be used for PD, which links to what our um, speakers uh, alluded to. So, you know, 180, 177 does seem like a lot, but we never changed from 180. And remember about 10 years ago, I think we had a horrific winter with snow. He didn't change at all. They're changing now. The time necessities. Just and finally, I um, want to point out some important dates for your administration and for you because we want to be fully staffed. Um, Al, as I said, did a phenomenal job uh, as an interim. Um, 
his um, position has been posted um, and ends on July 10th, the position posting. Then we'll go through the regular interview process. A house principal posting closed July 10th um, and uh, will be interviewed for that. Um, Agri Science Director will also close, but this one will close on August 20th because we have the animals to take care of in the summer, things like that. And also our director of PPS will be um, posted by the end of August. We should have someone on board. And I'll tell you, Shrumble was very, very fortunate. We hired some fantastic interviews who are skilled, a great skill set, and are experienced and knowledgeable and up to date on which direction a town like Trumbull should move to. And I, I applaud them and I thank them for helping me immensely. Um, I think that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, next on the agenda is the board chair report. The board has completed the interview process and we are now finalizing the state of Connecticut requirement for all professional employees in public education. Multiple reference checks are required um, and our consultant, Dr. Oska, will be coordinating that task. Upon successful completion of these checks, we will announce our appointment within the next week or two. Okay. Next, um, great. We have approval of the minutes, the action items. Um, I'm going to need a motion for this one. Who would like to make a motion for the approval? Lucinda, I'll make a motion. I make a motion to approve the minutes of the regular meeting of June 9th, 2020, the special meeting of June 16th, 2020, and the special meeting of June 29th, 2020. Okay, I need a second. I second. Tim Gallo seconds. Jackie made the motion. All right, does anyone have any changes they want to make to any of those three items? No? No? Okay. All in favor? All right. Let me go. Aye. Aye. Okay. I'm, yes, I agree. Mr. Gallo? Yes. Ms. Scott here? Yes, I agree. Okay. Mike Ward? Yes, I agree. Okay. And Jackie Marcel? In favor. Okay. Thank you. That's unanimous. All in favor for those. Thank you. Next is Mr. Isaac, the personnel. Thank you. Um, there are three retirements uh, this evening, and I want to say that each have made a very positive contribution to the Trouble Public Schools during their tenure here. We certainly wish them the very best, uh, a safe and healthy retirement, and thank them for a job well done. I do want to single out one individual because um, he's a 32 year veteran of Trouble Public Schools. He transformed a little makeshift marching band into one of the most outstanding bands in the country, into a national powerhouse. And that's Peter Horton. Um, he came to Greenwich. He's, he's just outstanding. A great person. Uh, loves kids. He's so dedicated. He's out here in rain, sleet, snow. He's taking them to the Orange Bowl, the Rose Bowl. He, uh, he's a leader. Uh, and he is just uh, just a stellar person. And uh, I want to wish him and his family the very, very best. And also ask the board to accept the reservations of Jennifer, um, Pete, and uh, Joe. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to need a motion, Mr. Gallagher. Uh, did we want to include the request for the legal action? You could. You could put it in here now, or you could do it separately. Okay. Why don't you go ahead and put that one in the ground? Okay, sure. Also, there's a leave of absence request of uh, Colette uh, Marie. Um, she complies with all of the board policy provisions, and uh, we recommend that the board approve that leave of absence. Thank you. So I would like to make a motion to approve um, the following retirements and requests for leave of absence. Um, the first one is Jennifer Charles, and she is house principal at Trumbull High. The second is Peter Horton, and I would, at the end of this, I would like to say a little something about Peter. Um, also, Geraldine uh, Pos Posino, who is an elementary math specialist. 
and um, the request for leave of absence is Colette Lamarie, who is a teacher at Frenchtown. Um, uh, I'm sorry, at Trumbull High School since August 2019. Do I have a second? Yeah, I'll second, second that. Thank you, Scott. Second. And I know, Mr. Kerr, you wanted to uh, speak about Mr. Uh, Horton. Yeah, absolutely. I, um, I, I am honored to, to speak on behalf of Pete because I had the pleasure of serving uh, with him as the president of the um, Parent Association for three years. And um, I still get ch choked up every time I talk about the band program, even though I don't have a, a student in it right now. Um, but all three of my boys benefited from it. And to think about the um, how impressive it was when you stood uh, next to that organization with Pete at the lead of it um, and the, the amount, the quality of performance they delivered, the organization and the commitment uh, that he inspired in people um, has made it the program that it is. And um, it is a nationally recognized program um, that has the envy of all of our uh, regional um, regional peers um, and we've got a huge set of shoes to fill uh, without Pete. Um, so uh, I wish him all the best in his retirement. Thank you, Mr. Bell. Yes, um, I, I would concur, Scott. And, and um, I would just like to say that uh, I definitely feel like I owe, I owe Pete a, a debt that I would never be able to repay. Um, my son walks me to school as a freshman uh, and, and playing the saxophone for four years with the marching band. Um, I was lucky enough to be the EMT, the volunteer EMT for the band for, for all four years. And um, just went with the band everywhere and uh, we just kept winning and winning and winning under Peter. And, and it was just an experience for my son, James, that uh, again, I, I would never be able to replay. So I, I think that's true with Tom Trumbull and also on a personal note. I just uh, you know, give you my greatest thanks, Pete. Wish, wish you all the best in your retirement, and uh, hopefully you and your wife can, you know, take a nice vacation. Well deserved. So thank you so much. And I want to say one thing also. I worked with Peter for most of his, all of his years at Trumbull High School, and when we started, it was a family, no matter what you taught. So I am very happy for him. I'm glad that he's going to retire right now, and I hope that he has a healthy and very happy retirement. He's done Trumbull High School well. We're so impressed every time Trumbull High School went out on a field. All you could do is cry and watch how wonderful they were. So thank you, Peter. Chokes me up to think about it, but he did a great job and I appreciate it. So, so my son also was in the marching band a little bit before Scott and you know, Tim, he was in the 90s and uh, you couldn't believe every year in the program was going to be better and better. So, uh, Okay, thank you very much. So we had a, a, a motion and a second. All in favor, I have to go through everyone. Mrs. Uh, yes, in favor. Yes, in favor. Mrs. Tiffinelli, yes, in favor. Mr. Gallo. I'm in favor. Um, Mr. Kerr. Yes, in favor. Mrs. Marcel. In favor. Mr. Ward. Yes, in favor. Thank you. Okay, that's unanimous. All in favor. Thank you, everyone. Okay, next on our agenda is digital learning, Mrs. Tepley. Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. 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 Okay. Um, you all received, the board members received in your board packet over the weekend, uh, the presentation. I'm just going to highlight some key elements uh, on the presentation. And really our purpose tonight is to give you an overview of digital learning while we were distance learning, as well as sort of what our goals and objectives and the things we were focused on um, during the school year. I typically, about every year, um, for those of you who have been on the board a while, usually come before you and sort of give an update on what we're doing, what our next set of goals are. I'm um, just to kind of keep you in the loop on, on what we're doing. So I'm going to share my screen and then talk about a few things. Okay. Can you see my screen okay? Yes. Excellent. So 
One of our, uh, the district goal number two is really tied to uh, distance learning and how distance learning and technology really should be in support of the best instructional practices and curriculum. So I always say that our philosophy is we're not about teaching the tool, we're about finding the best tool to sort of help support the teaching and learning process. So for teaching and learning for the 2019-2020 uh, school year, there's basically, as many of you know who have been here for a while, there's kind of two aspects to my job. Um, the first aspect is the teaching and learning piece where I work with the technology integrators and also work heavily with the teacher librarians and the curriculum team to really work on ways to integrate technology seamlessly into the curriculum. And then the other piece of my uh, role that I'm gonna talk about a little bit is to support the data systems and operations so it's infinite campus, it's all of the external feeds from different providers. And my focus there is usually on developing ways that we can be more efficient um, and sort of save costs and time and resources from a staff perspective so that those back end operation things can kind of happen in a seamless way. So from a teaching and learning perspective, the first five bullets really address um, what we did during distance learning. Just during distance learning, we offered over 165 PD sessions. And this was the work of the tech integrators um, for teachers, paras, staff, coaches, and that was all done remotely. We have a list of uh, about, I think it's about 35 different topics um, we covered during those 165 sessions. So they did a fabulous job doing that. Um, the other thing that we were really able to do by the end, if you remember our distance learning approach um, this spring, was a phased approach. So first we started with enrichment lessons and continuity of learning, and then we very quickly moved to sort of, uh, I'm sorry, recorded video. So teachers would record themselves doing something and then post it in their Google Classroom. Um, and then we sort of quickly moved, I would say about mid-May, to sort of live video and supporting teachers with live video so that they could have actually do synchronous learning with their kids. Um, we were very fortunate today, uh, Dr. Budd and I, and a group of uh, teachers from our pilot group um, from pre-K and a kindergarten teacher participated. We gave a PD session um, to throughout the state to many educators about how to support distance learning and live video and recorded video with your youngest population with students in pre-K, K one and two, um, because we feel like we did a really good job with that population and kind of focusing on the social emotional aspect. So that was pretty exciting. Um, we also spent a lot of time just creating those virtual events for high school scholarships, for athletic recognitions, moving up ceremonies for elementary and middle school. And again, that was sort of the great work of our tech integrators. Um, prior to sort of our uh, distance learning initiative, there was a lot of things going on. Um, we were, I was working heavily, and if you remember from my presentation about 15 months ago, um, one of the things we're trying to do is to align the work of the teacher librarians with the tech integrators. And this is gonna become even more fundamental because as you know, we're down three tech integrators next year um, in the budget. So we're really trying to work, bring those two teams together under sort of a di digital learning umbrella and really have them work together on delivering PD, working on curriculum together. Um, so we expect that good work to continue into next year. Um, and then we spent a lot of time supporting rollouts of new digital resources, textbooks and things that teachers needed to have available for students from home, some digital resources to record video and doing PD around those particular topics for teachers. So we also, as I talked about sort of my other hat um, that I focus on is sort of these data systems. So some of the things that we implemented were about really trying to improve efficiency. So we actually tied Infinite Campus and we're now syncing it with Centris, uh, we're using Centris Sync to IEP Direct, which is our special ed uh, system. So what used to happen is a teacher would, uh, uh, a special ed teacher who had a special ed student would have to add a new student to IEP Direct, but they were their demographics were already in Infinite Campus. Now those systems talk to each other, so we don't have redundant data entry. And it makes our data, when we do our data reports for the state, much more accurate because those systems are synced quite nicely at this point. So we've had a lot of good feedback on that. Um, you know, this, uh, we also implemented, a, uh, tied the school lunch system to infinite campus messaging so that we could send out letters and robo 
robo calls via infinite campus for people with overdue lunch balances. So what used to happen before is Betty Cinco and the food service managers used to have to type out letters, get envelopes, mail them to the families, and they would do that on a monthly basis. We've actually been able to eliminate that. And I'm happy to report, uh, Betty indicated that as of in May, we only had about $800 in outstanding lunch balances, where in previous years, we were about $25, $2,800. So that was sort of a significant increase in just getting those unpaid balances paid. Um, and again, most of these things are about automation, changing the process for resetting passwords for parent and student portals. Um, the CRD C reporting is the civil rights report we have to do every two years. And much of that was manually done out of the superintendent's offices. So what I did was I wrote some scripts for Lauren and them so that we can kind of automate some of that process so it's not quite as labor intensive. And then the only other thing I'll mention on here is that many of you know, I think we mentioned several months ago, we're now currently under, under an agreement with the Office of Civil Rights um, regarding our website accessibility. So we've had to make some changes over the last probably six months to improve um, the accessibility options for people um, with disabilities. So we are in agreement with that. We have to provide them with a report at the end of December on some objectives and goals that we had to sort of further continue the accessibility options. So that you'll hear about probably more in the, in the coming fall as we prepare for that December report. Infrastructure and operations. This is the piece. Um, this is really a lot of what's done by the IT folks. My role really is sort of that conduit between the teaching and learning aspects from technology and then working with Jeff Hackett and his fabulous team to sort of figure out what we need, how we need to implement it, and how we better support all of our users. So these are many of the things that they did. They responded to over 10,000 support tickets from a variety of different people. We're not used to sort of supporting people in their homes that you know before distance learning that really wasn't as much of a component of their job but we created an online form and they've been really good at sort of servicing both parents and families um, with that as well we also distributed about 187 uh, 870 loaner chromebooks um, which was more than we expected when we originally had surveyed parents we had a lot of parents who said i have technology for my kid we're good and then what happened is a month into this they realized that they had three kids sharing the same device so they needed to get more devices from the school so that all the students could engage in the learning properly um, so we created a great system for that and i'm going to talk a little bit um, in a few minutes about sort of what our plans are to sort of get ready for the potential of distance learning for next year so these are some of the lessons we learned with regarding um, distance learning. We learned that, you know, we did a lot of communications. We did weekly newsletters. Jonathan and I went and did almost a weekly television broadcast on uh, Trumbull Television. We had tutorials put out for parents um, and a website where they could access tutorials on how to use Google Classroom. Um, but the more communication you do, the more you realize it's never enough and you have to keep doing more. So we're going to try to continue many of those things going into next year. Um, we also discovered that teacher for P teacher PD, we really needed to offer it in a variety of different ways, a variety of different times. So we had a lot of teachers who said, I really want to take advantage of some of these optional PD, but I have young kids. Can you do some at eight o'clock at night? Because that was really the best time for them. So really to reach a large audience, we really decided to sort of focus on delivering those PD at a variety of different days and times to meet the teacher's needs. Um, what we also did discover on this was that we need to have a learning management platform for our pre-K to grade two students going into next year. Um, I'll be working with a pilot group of teachers, a work group, the end of July and beginning of August to look at maybe three different products so that we can choose one that meets the needs of the teachers um, and that they think will work well with their students. Our model this year was grades three through 12, we used Google Classroom, worked great. Um, Pre-K to grade two, two could probably go to Google Classroom, but I'm gonna let the pilot group kind of make their recommendation on that. 
Um, but we really need to find an, a, a developmentally appropriate platform for that age group. What we did this year is we would email the parents, the teacher would email the parents every day with the work, and then the parents would have to take a picture of it to submit the work and email it back to the teacher. So there are some really good platforms out there geared towards younger students, and we're going to sort of investigate that further for implementation in, in the fall. Um, I have, our focus really needs to be to, you know, to continue our collaboration with technology teachers and classroom teachers. The pilot group we had for elementary for live learning had both technology integrators and classroom teachers. And that's also what I want to do when we do the selection of the management platform, really to make teachers and technology integrators working together on that. So you can kind of read sort of some of the other things on what are lessons uh, that we learned, but those were kind of some of the key highlights. So what's next? Um, based on all those lessons learned and sort of our goals and objectives, and I think Ralph had mentioned uh, in the beginning, one of the uh, things the district has to do is to come up with three phases um, for the reopening of schools. Um, one is phase one, the full opening, phase two is the hybrid, and phase three is everyone's doing distance learning. So I've been actually chairing the committee, the teaching and learning committee, um, which has four administrators, four teachers, two parents, and a curriculum person. So that group has been really working very hard on what school might look like from a teaching and learning perspective. Um, and I'm really excited about the work that they do. Um, with the assumption that we need to have those plans, you know, phase two and three, sir, actually, and even one if parents select it, even have a distance learning component, we were trying to figure out what are the things we need to focus on in next year. So one of the things we're going to do is expand our one-to-one -one program, which was all we were already doing in grades five through eight from three through eight. This way those kids will take their Chromebooks from school to home every day. The good news is we already have those Chromebooks because we had a Chromebook for each of those students already. We just kept them in a cart in the classroom. So we will actually start to send them home and actually also put them under the one-to-one -one insurance program like we do for the fifth to eighth grade. So that's kind of an easy one for us to do. Um, we need to supplement the high school BYOD program with a more formalized loaner program. Many of the high school kids like to use their own devices, but we really want to, from the first week of school, anyone that doesn't have a device at the high school level, to really get them a loaner that they can use for the duration and, again, take it to and from school every day. Um, we talked about the learning management platform. Uh, we need to do significant work and continue our work with aligning the work of the tech integrators, redefining the tech integrator position, because as you know, we have three going into next year instead of six. So we're gonna have to change um, some of the things that we do um, and really aligning that work with the teacher librarian group. So to further bring both the teacher librarian and the technology integrator role really into a real digital learning department. I, me and some of the tech integrators went to a couple of schools last fall and visited Wilton to kind of see their distance learning program. We were also at New Canaan. We got some good lessons learned from them on sort of how they bring these two roles into their whole library media program and learning commons model and what that looks like. So we'll need to sort of to further develop that. Um, and as usual, we want to continue to offer all of those, uh, you know, designing lessons for online delivery, working on increasing PD opportunities for blended learning. Um, all of these suggestions on here, I just want to say, are really driven by a lot of feedback we got from parents on the surveys that we, drew, we had in the spring. All of the information we've gotten in surveys as well is also driving the work of sort of the teaching and learning reopening committee. So we do value that parent feedback. Um, we look at those surveys, we look at all that information really to help us determine what our goals need to be next year. And in the way of communication, like I said before, you can never do enough. Um, in March, we were supposed to have our first live parent university where we were going to offer technology sessions for parents um, to come on a Saturday morning. And then obviously with COVID, it didn't happen in March. So what I'd like to do with the tech integrators is to see if we can offer a virtual parent university because we do have a lot of need for the community to learn how does Google Classroom work? What does it look like from a child's perspective? And really we think it's part of our job to educate the larger community on how we, they can support education and technology at home. And particularly with distance learning, that's kind of even more important than it was before. 
And then data operations, again, looking at ways to make us more efficient, looking at ways for cost saving. We're gonna be migrating Infinite Campus on next week, on July 21st, um, from a premise-based solution to the cloud. It actually saves us a, a, you know, a couple of thousand dollars per year to do that. Um, we're going to, we also purchased Infinite Campus's online registration module. So this is gonna allow us to, you know, redefine the registration process, which used to be you came in person on a particular day. Now we will actually use the online registration system, um, probably launch it sometime in the fall. Um, so parents can register online, they can upload their forms. Uh, the great thing about it is that when the parent puts their information in and out of central office, they process the registration, no one then has to enter, do data entry of all the information on the form. It's already there. So it really saves a lot of time and efficiency from that standpoint. And we were able to fund doing the online registration module by some of the savings we have by moving Infinite Campus to the cloud. So just kind of looking at those different ways that we can kind of improve our data and operations and make that run more smoothly. Absolutely. Um, Jeff's group has some plans to, they're upgrading all the wireless access points in elementary schools, particularly if we're going to be doing distance learning and live streaming from classrooms in the school, trying to build up the infrastructure. Um, we'll be replacing smart boards in grades four and five. Many of those smart boards are 12, 13 years old. I'm sure Jackie I can tell you probably some of the ones are even older than that, um, but we're, they're sort of starting to fail. So we really want to get on a replacement plan and we're going to start with grades four and five. So that's about all I have. Um, but we did think it was important to give you guys just an opportunity of sort of what we're doing, where we're going, what's driving our decisions and our goals, and really, you know, what me and my team kind of focus on, along with great support from Jeff's team and working with Jonathan on the curriculum side on how, you know, how we can do a better job in Trumbull. So if you have any questions. Okay, so you're working this summer on the possibility that if ever need um, e-learning or distance learning in the future that you're working with the teachers to decide on how you're going to present these options, correct? Yeah, we have a teaching and learning uh, reopening committee. I know, uh, I think Ralph said there are 17 different committees. One of them is that instruction committee, um, which I'm chairing. I, I mentioned that there are four administrators, four teachers, two parents, and we're kind of working on what those options would look like. So what does it look like in phase one when all the students are back? Um, you know, some of the things we've kind of thrown around is from the first day of school, even if we're live reopened and most kids are there, we need to get everyone comfortable logging into their Chromebook, getting teachers set up in the Google Classroom so that from the first week of school, we're kind of prepared for whatever else happens after that point. So really kind of front loading a lot of that stuff um, so that we're in a better position if we have to go to a hybrid model or if we have to go to all distance learning, um, just making sure we have all those, in, those structures in place. Okay, thank you. So Having talked to many colleagues who are still teaching, one of the things, you know, knowing that I, you know, I have been on curriculum, they mentioned a lot of systems, and I don't know if that's something we can look at, they talked about Microsoft Teams. One of the ladies, one of the teachers, well, she was actually a speech pathologist in another district just said to me, well, she was assigned, um, her team was a special ed team, she was the support, et cetera. So is that something we're looking at? I don't know, again, it's mostly for high school. I don't think they were doing it also in some school. But is it something we're looking at if we have to go to this? Yeah, so we do have the Office 365 product. Um, in district for any, a lot of our, uh, I would say, Long Hill office employees use more of the Microsoft suite and the Office 365 piece. Um, there are Microsoft Teams. There's a bunch of other things that are in there. Um, and I know some of the business teachers at the high school really use with the kids a lot of the office products as opposed to Google, because that's what they're going to be using sort of in the business world. So one of the things that I'd like to do is to take a look at that maybe with the business teachers at the high school and see 
see if there are some functions of that that we want to, you know, continue and kind of use it with sort of specific departments. I mean, Google works really well in that it's simple. So we have able to use it even with first and second graders often, um, where when you get into, you know, some of the Office 365 products, it's a little bit more complex, particularly for your younger users. But yeah, I mean, Jeff Hackett and I have always had the belief that we need to support both of those platforms and support teachers in their use of those platforms. So I certainly expect that's something we would continue. And if there's interest from the teachers on PD around that, um, particularly at the high school level, um, we should be providing that. Okay, so again, it's not just, I'm not, I'm not going against the Google Classroom. This was with the Google Classroom. In fact, they're even talking about Blackboard. So, yeah. you know, I would like to open a little more of this to our staff. I know it's a lot of work, ideally, we don't like to be back in school, but they are things we have to look at, I think. So. Yeah, agreed. And we did a survey with teachers, I want to say it's probably about two years ago, um, but we probably at some point need to solicit some feedback. I like to base the PD that we offer based on sort of what the teacher's needs and interests are. So we really should take sort of a temperature check on see how well Google Classroom's working, what additional th resources do teachers need, and, and try to, you know, make sure that we're meeting that as well. Uh, Madam Chairman, I got a question. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. 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 First of all, Christine, very nice job uh, your report. Uh, two questions. Uh, do all the families or all the children that are attending Trumbull Public Schools have access to a computer and distant learning that you're aware of? Do we have so, any information? Yeah, we, uh, we created we created a mechanism to um, find out which students didn't have a device, didn't have enough devices in the families. We also um, discovered through lots of different means that we had about four families in district that did not have adequate internet access at their home. Um, and we actually, Jeff's team, we purchased some hotspots for the Chromebooks and we are actually providing internet access for those four families. Um, we, I think we ordered about a dozen of them in anticipation that we might have have, you know, families in the future that don't really have adequate access to, you know, access distance learning. And fundamentally, we are all about sort of equity. So we want to make sure, you know, it's our job to make sure that every kid has what they need so that they can really participate fully. Um, we do plan, uh, Dr. Budd and I talked a little bit about working with the social workers next year just to make sure we didn't miss anybody um, who might be having, you know, need more access to technology that they don't necessarily have at home. The second question I have is, uh, with the reduction of, of the tech uh, integrators, we lost three, right? Yes. And I meant to ask uh, the superintendent, if we were to ask with FEMA to replace those three, if we go to distant learning, is that an acceptable request? I'm not too sure. My, my understanding is, hold on. My understanding is FEMA monies uh, cannot be used to replace staff members. No personnel can be added. No, they're mainly for PPE and related equipment. I just hope that uh, since the state won't do it, we will look very carefully at a very area in our present budget, which we got July 1st, to keep in back of our mind that it's possible if we do go to distant learning that we support the uh, technology department with additional personnel. And also I thought with the librarians also being the training, could they also fill in with those three slots that are missing? I'm not too yes. sure we can do that. Yeah. Does it require dual certification? I'm gonna focus on that in Jonathan's, uh, um, I think he's next and one after that. He's gonna mention that. One of the other things talking about distance learning and looking at it, if we end up with that, one of the suggestions were to make it um, a little bit, I don't want to say tougher, but, uh, more difficult, more rigorous. more rigorous, that's a great word, more rigorous for our students. Uh, some parents and some teachers felt it wasn't as rigorous as it should have been. And that's one of the things they're looking at right now. Okay, thank you. Uh, Christine, for the, short time that you had to, for the short time you had to get ready for this whole thing, 
in March. I think your department did a nice job, and I thank you for that. I'm all done. Thank you. I just wanted to, Christine, so how most of our librarians in the elementary school have, most of them come out of the uh, training in order to uh, have learning co commons that they have computer backgrounds? Yeah, and one of the things I'm working on with them is trying to make sure that the teacher librarians get the Google one, uh, Google certification level one and level two, so that they're as proficient sort of, you know, supporting teachers and kids as right. our technology integrators are. So we've been trying right. to, you know, build their capacity that way as well. And that way you can combine them with the three tech mm -hmm. people that we have left and sort of have a team. Yeah, and the, and the model in Wilton and New Canaan is that they have, uh, teacher librarians and tech, tech integrators that are all under their digital learning umbrella all support their learning commons and in fact all of their technology integrators are also certified teacher librarians so they try to really align the work of those two groups um, which is kind of the direction we started to move in last you know last year and hopefully you know we'll more fully develop that model going into this year thank you it makes a lot more sense now to hear that Christina thank I, you I, I, if I just wanted to say, I just wanted to um, second Mike's appreciation. You had a heck of a year, did a lot of uh, a lot of creative stuff. And I have to say, when I look at, you know, you getting back end projects like the integration to IEP Direct um, and implementing online registration and going to the cloud all at the same time that you were doing that, um, you know, kudos to you on that. Um, the, the question that I had was um, relative to the bring your own device at the high school, do do we are we encouraging or establishing a standard of what the minimum device is? Like our our high school students um, essentially getting by on their smartphones, or are they? Re is it really necessary that they have a, a tablet or a um, computer? Uh, so we so. Uh, the, at the high school in the beginning of the year, they actually send out, uh, the principal sends out a memo about BYOD, bring your own device, and we give minimal technical specifications. We do say that if you're bringing your own device, your phone is not considered the learning device. It needs to have a keyboard. It needs to, you know, it needs to be kind of a full functioning device. We don't, uh, we don't disallow uh, cell phones in the high school, but when we're talking about having a device to do work on, we really have some minimal um, expectations of a tablet, laptop, Chromebook. And if you don't have one of those, um, you know, we're expanding kind of our loaner program out of the learning commons at the high school to make sure every kid does have a device that they can use that meets those specifications. Excellent. Thank you. <clears throat> Yes, so Christina, um, thank you again for your report. It was very comprehensive and excellent. Um, but I, I do have a question. You, you talked about New Canaan and Wilton and visiting there, and you know that I'm a, I'm a teacher currently in Wilton. We've moved to the Schoology um, program platform, which supposedly is all encompassing. It will, it will you know, Google, you can do Google through it and do a number of different platforms through it. Um, in your experience with Wilton, what would you have you considered school G here for Trumbull or so in my previous district we were using Schoology at the high school level. Um, you know, there's a couple of challenges to it. One is it's an expense, right? So we get the Google platform for free. Um, Schoology has, if you think, if you're familiar with kind of what higher ed does with sort of their learning, full-fledged learning management systems, um, Schoology is very much like that. So if, when you think of a Blackboard, um, like somebody, like I think Marie had mentioned earlier, it's kind of in that realm. Um, I like the Schoology product. It's pricey. Um, so I, I'm not saying it's sort of off the table, we probably certainly could, should look at it. Um, I, again, my sort of mindset is when we look at those products really to involve teachers in that process um, and have them try it out with kids. And we could certainly, you know, do that if we think that's a direction that we want to go. But again, there's sort of a cost to that. And, you know, we have not had a lot of money from a budgeting standpoint to sort of do a lot of these add-ons at this point. But I will definitely keep it, you know, in, in the, you know, forefront and as we sort of have further discussions about what we want this to look like, you know, moving forward, um, maybe there's an opportunity to explore that with some teachers. Christina, did you hear? Um, yeah, we're just wondering, so something, you know, 
we can look at? What, what kind of costs are we talking about? Gee, it's been a while since I looked at it, um, but you know, it can be, you know, Tim, maybe you have a better idea of what Wilton's spending. I can certainly, I have some contacts in Wilton and can kind of see if we're sort of interested in that. But again, whether it's Schoology or these other platforms, I think it's just important to have teachers involved in that process. And why I would say it's definitely worth looking at, because I actually like Schoology. I was an early Schoology adopter. Um, I would also think we should be somewhat cautious, particularly if we're doing distance learning in the fall. Like, I don't want to start changing platforms on people, but it might be a good thing to explore next year to see if it's something we want to pursue the year after and if it gives us more functionality. Unfortunately, us on the board and to just back up what I'm hearing. I understand what you're saying about teachers, but at the end, we have to kind of make some decisions. Obviously, if there's a cost factor, we'll, we'll talk about it and see what we can do. But I think our teachers, if, and again, it's a big if, we're going to distance learning, we do have to up our game. We do have to be a little bit more like the districts around us. And uh, we may have to provide more PD, but it's something we need to look at. Thank you. All right, if there aren't any more questions, um, Christina, thank you very much for the presentation. It was very detailed, very comprehensive. Um, and if we have any questions, um, we will get back to you. But thank Excellent. You so thank you, Christina. Thanks. Thank you. All right, next, um, it's going to be Dr. Bud. He's going to give us an update on the uh, school start time committee. Yes, so Mr. Hackett is presenting, uh, projecting a presentation, and I hope everybody who's watching is able to see it. Uh, this will be posted uh, after this meeting on the uh, later school start time committee section of our TPS website. So I'll just give Mr. Hackett a second to get this up. So I was asked uh, to provide this update at this meeting on our current later school start time committee. And so a brief history. Uh, on February 26, 2019, uh, the work of a prior exploratory committee was presented to the board at that time by external consultant, Jonathan Costa. And his presentation is also now on the TPS website as a reminder to people. And then on March 10th of this year, Dr. Sarah Raskin from Trinity College uh, presented to this board research on later school start times for adolescent health. And her presentation is also up on the TPS website. Uh, at the June 9th meeting, this board voted to establish the following committee on later school start time with the uh, names and uh, positions proposed by Superintendent Ayasagda then. Uh, four of them, indicated by an asterisk were on the prior exploratory committee that Jonathan Costa was a consultant for. I was not on that committee, but Mr. Garino, Mr. King, Ms. Perkins, and Mr. Rickard were. So at the June 9th meeting, besides establishing this committee, I would say in viewing, in being at the meeting and then in viewing the tape several times, the following three discussion themes came up in the board discussion. First of all, the board's interest in a timeline and action reports, the board's interest in transparency in whatever the process was, including some opportunity for the public to be involved, and also articulated at the June 9th meeting was a charge to say, okay, we a prior exploratory committee. We heard information about how this is good uh, from a uh, mental health perspective, from a physical health perspective, but what we don't have yet is enough detail on implementation. What would it be like to implement later school start times in trouble? And what would that require? And there's almost certainly a financial cost to what it would require. And there might be some other things that are required. But right now, okay, the research is out there. But from an implementation perspective, what would it even look like in trouble compared to any other district? So I would say in reviewing that meeting, those were the three things that came up and they're the themes I'm going to speak to more tonight. Uh, as I said at the June 16th meeting, uh, we have now set up a section of the TPS website dedicated to this topic. Both of the prior board presentations were, are there. 
Uh, there is a feedback mechanism for members of the public who would like to contribute any public comment on this through writing. We have that similarly for policy committee. And eventually, agendas and minutes of this committee will be there. Uh, I also said at the June 16th meeting, uh, following your direction uh, at the June 9th meeting, that I would come back tonight to present my recommendations for a more detailed plan, including the charge and timeline. And uh, as I said at the June 9th meeting, you've asked me to chair a committee. My recommendation, or my plan is to make the best recommendation to you on how I think this committee could best function. And then what I'll be asking tonight is your discussion and uh, approval or modification of that plan. So first, speaking about a timeline and action reports, and in general, some board members and maybe all board members said we can't have uh, a committee that doesn't have some accountability. We want to know what's going on in this committee. So I would recommend from the point we're at now that this committee meet monthly between now and October with subcommittee meetings in between. This is similar instruction, the very successful reopening committee, Superintendent Ayasagna has described. And I'll talk about the subcommittees in a minute. Then I would recommend that in November, the committee present to the full board its progress and any recommendations. And uh, going into this with, uh, without a bias one way or the other on implementation, the committee may say, this is what we've discussed and we don't have a recommendation, but here's what we've done. Or there might be a recommendation. Uh, we'll have to see what happens. That timeline, because it happens before the budget in December 2020, would potentially allow for implementation in 2021, 2022. Uh, a timeline later than that would probably delay potential, I say potential implementation, yet another school year. Because from every district we've studied, there's some financial cost to this, and I think the board would want to know the details of that prior to the next budget presentation and give the next superintendent some directive about whether to go in that uh, direction or not. So those, that, those would be my recommendations on timeline and action reports to the board. On transparency steps, I would recommend, as was suggested by several board members at the June 9th meeting, that the committee, member, the committee meetings be publicly noticed, like we do for policy committee, curriculum committee, finance, and that we have public comment on the agenda. We also have those meetings correspondence at the agenda, so people who send in written comments, we share them. Uh, but we establish some opportunity for public comment, and that we would also take minutes. As I said, we post them on the website, and we would share the meeting, uh, share the minutes monthly with the Board of Education. But of course, board members, like anybody else, could attend these meetings. Uh, uh, and I didn't put exactly how they'd attend. In the current structure, they'd attend them on Zoom uh, or Google Meets, but hopefully, uh, by the time we get to October, we're back to some kind of meeting where people could actually attend. But we'll see. There'll be some mechanism for people to attend, to observe, and to comment. Oh, you can meet outside. Oh, you could meet outside. That's true. Now, as far as implementing the charge, and this is again the charge that I took away from the last meeting, we're at we're at the stage of looking at implementation. What would implementation look like in trouble? And then what it, would it require? So the board has the best information on that. I did find a very succinct two-page document from the American Psychological Association that I've linked to in this presentation on later school start times promote adolescent well-being. And uh, board members who happen to have a copy, but it will be on the uh, presentation when it's posted. Uh, on the back page, page two, uh, I think the nice thing about this uh, brief is that it talks about, okay, here are the medical benefits. And then here are the concerns. And so the conclusion is that you have to balance the benefits with the concerns and see what comes out of that. And this has to be Trumbull's decision because the specifics in Trumbull are going to be different from the specifics in Fairfield, New Haven, wherever district we talk about it, Connecticut or anywhere else. And that's the board's ultimate decision based on the work of the committee. Now, continuing on implementation of the charge, I have looked at other districts who uh, have had later school start time committees. Now, frankly, many of them had the same committee from the beginning till the end. We, we had a prior exploratory committee with some people who aren't here anymore, and, and that has stopped, and now we're a little bit restarting. 
But when you look at all those committees, I think it comes down to four main threads that I would suggest have to be investigated. Here's the first one. What would implementation look like in terms of interdistrict coordination, including athletics and Trumbull Public School students attending interdistrict programs? So athletics might be simpler to explain, which is just how do our students compete interscholastically if the day differs, and what does that require? Interdistrict programs are things like a regional center for the arts, aquaculture, and what would happen in terms of implementation to our arrangements with those programs. I don't go into this with uh, uh, a ton of knowledge about it, but what I go into it with is saying to you, I believe there needs to be a subcommittee to invest in that. The second subcommittee I would recommend is stakeholder impact. And this is a broad category, but it means things like how are parents affected by later school start times? And they, some might be affected in positive ways, some in negative ways. Certainly some kind of community outreach on this will be important. But it's very important that people understand the different dimensions as far as parents or teachers or other uh, staff in the district. There are contractual implications, for example, not just for teachers, but for other members of our bargaining unit that have to be understood for the whole picture. Uh, no doubt, student transportation has to be a third category because there are details there. There are some things that could be changed in board policy about transportation. There's some things that can't be changed based on state law. So we actually have had a little bit of information on this one in the past, but we have to get this nailed down a bit so the board gets the right information. And then fourth, what would implementation look like in terms of town impacts? You might originally initially say, well, it's a Trumbull Public Schools decision. One example of this might be the TLC program. TLC program is set up currently around a certain structure in our elementary schools, but also staffed by many high school students who work there. So if there were later school start times, what would happen in terms of TLC? What would be required? But there might be other town impacts. There have been districts near us who have had significant uh, changes positive or negative to traffic patterns in town uh, because of buses being in different places at different types of times. So my suggestion would be that these four committees, uh, subcommittees would work well and would follow the model of the reopening. Now, my suggestion would be, if you take a look at the people currently uh, associated with this committee uh, based on the prior membership, uh, they divide probably in groups like this. There could be some adjustments, but Mike King goes with an athletics sub subcommittee, almost certainly. Stuart Schwartz, community member, might have some interest in that town impact. But I am going to recommend, because you asked me to come to you with my best recommendations, that you consider expanding this committee slightly so that there are more uh, voices on these subcommittees. And I want to explain my rationale for four reasons. It's clear the Trumbull community is engaged and interested in this issue. And that some may have a lot of information, some may have a little information, but with that degree of community involvement, I think it's just great to capitalize on it. Second, the board has supported transparency and involvement. The third is that most subcommittees have far reaching elements. So for example, on that stakeholder impact, I'm gonna strongly suggest we have a parent from every level of the system pre-K, K-5, middle school, high school, because it might look very different. And also, when I look at similar committees in comparative districts, and West Hartford had a study that was similar, and they're very similar in size to us, uh, and in demographics as well, uh, they have larger committees. I think that that would allow us, and me at the end of the day as the chair to say, we have brought diverse voices together uh, in a structure that works. So as an example, I put on the next slide, based on the four subcommittees I'd recommend, uh, the addition of one or two parents to each committee, and actually a couple of students to the uh, Athletic Interdistrict Committee and the Stakeholder Impact Committee. It's a perfect example. Some people say, well, what will happen to kids who have after-school jobs? And I don't know the exact answer to that, but I think it's actually great that we've seen it on policy committee when interested students participate, and I think we get a voice from them that's different from just, uh, just the adults. And finally, just let me say on the last one with town impact, 
I might suggest a town representative there. Somebody from TLC might be a natural example or there are others. So my last slide is simply, uh, I'd be prepared to be moving with this, but I bring it to the board tonight to ask that uh, to the extent you can, you discuss and approve this charge timeline transparency steps subcommittee and expanded membership, which I would recommend fairly to you as a way to implement this test. Okay, Dr. Bunn, um, quick question. Our person that is the uh, student representative to the board, whoever that's going sure. to be, that person can probably uh, be on this committee, don't you think? I would think so. I'm not actually positive that person has been picked yet, but I can check with the high school. Okay. Because that would be, that person was supposed to represent K-12, so that might be a person you can look into. I don't know who that will be. Okay. But, and um, we, have a, we have a young woman uh, uh, who will be a senior uh, on the policy committee as well. It might be really interesting. All right. Okay. And I would look to, maybe you should also include somebody from the uh, programs the AgriSites program, Aquaculture, all the ones that are going on the, uh, that are those, you know, um, what's the other one, RTA, you know, it's going to affect them. That's right. So someone, there should be a representative. And some of those people actually do have experience because they've had this conversation with other districts and they sometimes led to different outcomes, but it won't be a new topic for some of those people. Okay. Um, is there any other questions that people want to ask? I just a little discussion. So uh, I I think it was an, it's an excellent report. You did a great job, John, and putting this together. Um, really appreciate it. And I, I think it could be maybe an excellent template for uh, other committees down the line, perhaps the diversity committee that was mentioned earlier this evening to follow a similar format. Um, now you mentioned expanding it, and how many members did you have a number of of and also with Lucinda's most recent recommendation that might change your number. Yeah, I would expand it if you look at the next to last page by approximately six or seven people in the parent student category, and perhaps one from those interdistrict programs. Okay. And, and what we typically do, uh, besides the uh, the board of the policy representatives, is, is we have parents and students who have contacted us routinely on things. We can get recommendations from board members for sure. But I think that this is not a committee or topic where the community has no idea what's going on. I think you have people who want to be involved. Right, sounds that way. And um, you also mentioned before about the, uh, the stakeholder piece, and you talked about how it would be so important um, to have them at the different grade levels. And and I've been I have this burning question that I, I'm hoping to get answered. And I, I believe that it probably would fall maybe in that stakeholder area. And then it has to do with the, the kindergarten through second grade um, in Wilton, where I, where we currently have the later school start times. They have the latest school start time kindergarten through second grade. Um, we have a separate school for, for that for that group. Um, and that's very different here in trouble. So I, I would I would be very interested on in how that group would be affected and um, you know are they being looked at as the latest school start time like like they are in Wilson. So um, th those would be my questions and I think it would be important to have uh, members in the stakeholder committee that were from all the grade levels to be able to look at things like that. So thank you for that recommendation as well. Yeah, uh, Lucinda, Jackie. Uh, Jonathan, I see you say two parents and all I would ask is if it's two that we make sure that it's maybe high school and elementary, yeah. if it's middle school and that, so that we don't forget about the elementary school. Right. If there's three parents, it would be easy. You would have one at each level, but when there's two, Let's just be careful that we make sure that the elementary level gets to be heard. And with good credence to Dr. Wheeler, the pre-K shouldn't be ignored either because we have a rich tech ed program. Right. Um, it does generate tuition for parents. And we would, I think one consideration to the board would be, will that tuition bank rate be affected one way or the other by a different start time? Must be considered, I would think. Absolutely. So, hey, Lucinda, I Jonathan, can I jump in? Yeah, I just, uh, Jonathan, I just, I just want to say thank you very much. It's a terrific uh, outline, and particularly as, um, as a person that was advocating for a different structure um, for this committee, I am, you know, couldn't be more pleased with um, the way you approach this and the recommendations that you're making. Um, so thank you very much for the very thoughtful work. 
Um, and I'm sure that uh, the rest of the committee will will benefit greatly from you know the suggestions that you're making. And I think the expansion is is key um, to include those other voices, not just as uh, things that they'd like to see, but but the pitfalls, right? Because I think having having more more people looking at things and and poking you know poking at it to make sure it's solid um, is terrific. So thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Never ends. So having a nice goal in sight is a positive thing. That's great. All right. So what would you like us to do? Would you like us to uh, approve your plan? I would prefer you do that if you're comfortable with it. Then I need a motion. Who's going to make the motion? So I'm going to make a motion to to approve uh, Jonathan's suggestions. Do we have a second? Probably add to that motion of how many people we will expand by. I, I don't think we need that. I don't think you need to do that. All you have to do is approve the plan, and Jonathan will go on with that. Yeah. Okay, so I would like to make a motion to approve the later school start time committee plan presented tonight by John, Dr. Jonathan Clark. Second. I'll, I'll second, second it. That. Well, that's to Scott second it because I thought he. Okay, Scott's going to second. Okay. All right. All in favor? I'm going to go through the list again. Okay, Mr. Tatini. Uh, Tiffanelli in favor. Mr. Gallo. I'm in favor. Okay, Mr. Ward. Uh, I'm in favor, and I just like to comment, Jonathan. The best job is, as always. You're the great guy. Thank I'm you. I'm in favor. Mr. Care. Uh, yes, in favor. Okay, and Mrs. Marcel. In favor, and I echo the rest of the board in saying, Jonathan, a wonderful job. I think it's exactly where we had hoped to go with this committee. So thank you. Uh, no, no, that's, that's yours. Okay, thank you very much. Yes. I also want to echo the comments. Get out of the mic. We'll bring the mic to you. Jack, I've talked to many times on this, and I'll tell you what. From the team to now, what a phenomenal job he has done putting together each piece, okay? And uh, really, it's an outstanding report. Echo what the rest of the board said. Uh, super job and uh, uh, you are right. Thank you very much, Jonathan. You know we all think it's an exceptional job. Okay. okay, and you're still up because the next item is you. It is the 20 2020-21 planning updates for student enrollment and parent guardian reopening survey. Okay, Mr. Hackett is uh, moving on to the next slide. Okay. Speaking of topics that never end, the new student enrollment. They do keep coming because Trumbull Public Schools in the town of Trumbull is the place to be. We're going to talk about uh, the total student enrollment predicted right now. We're also going to talk about the recent survey we did of parents and guardians last week about reopening because they, did, they do relate. Uh, by the way, our intention, Superintendent I and Sagan and I, are to give you updates on K-5 enrollment every two, every board meeting from this point forward, because we want to not have any bunch of problems like we've had in the past. It, it does relate in part to having the right staffing. Thank you. So I share on this first slide what I think the board is very familiar with, but I'll just say a little bit about for the public, which is board guidelines are in kindergarten to have 20 students per section, in grades one to two, 22 students per section, and in grades three to five, 25 students per section. So that will affect much of what you see on the next slides. But this is a very unusual year with COVID-19. Our student enrollment process is different in at least two ways. Now we've been doing, because we had to, online registration in a uh, Google form way since mid-May which means our numbers are more up to date than usual. In the past, a parent would have to call and get an appointment. It might be eight days before they could get an appointment. But, but now we see in real time their paperwork and there's only a one or two day lag period. But the other thing that we're not sure about with COVID-19 is the real estate trends, uh, especially in the rental market in some of our areas of town, but even in the home buying market, are we behind trends simply because people haven't been able to sell or to buy. So this is a moving target. That's why we want to keep you updated. 
So as you know from previous years, we're monitoring enrollment daily, particularly in any grade at any school where the gain or the loss of one or two students would cause one more section or one less section. So there are many schools or grades where you'd have to get 20 more kids or 15 more kids in order to get another section. And we would not predict that's likely. But if we're only one or two away, I have to be able to say to you that may change uh, in the next two weeks. So I'm gonna show you each of these six schools. Right now, these are up-to-date numbers as of today. Now, in order to be enrolled in a public school in Connecticut, you must prove residency, which I'll come back to in another slide, and that your child is of school age. And uh, these, in, under the enrolled students column, are actual students who have proved those things for next year. So I just talk about kindergarten booth notes. It's a good example of the fourth, uh, first row. Right now, there are 80 students registered. That's 20 per section. That's our guideline where we would say, if we get more, we should add another section. That's why in the right-hand column, it says the potential of one more section. Now in grade one at Booth Hill, that's at 88. Now that's where our guideline is 22 students a class. So if that goes up a little more, another section there. It also could go down because we have that happen. The same thing that's true in our rental market or our uh, uh, real estate market is true in other towns' real estate markets as well. But if you go down to grade two at Booth Hill, 70 for, um, for grade two, that would have to drop significantly by five students or more for us to lose a section. And it would have to go up way significantly for us to gain a section. So that's why if you look at Booth Hill, right now we have 483 kids enrolled for spread into 24 sections with the potential of one or two more sections. And I'll talk more briefly about the other five schools because the principle is the same. At Daniels Farm School, we have 491 students enrolled. And uh, that's in 25 sections. But two of them, grade three or four, could potentially go down. So we're monitoring those. But currently, at least uh, 25 sections at Daniels Farm. Probably won't go high. Uh, Frenchtown, uh, I would... Uh, there's a, there's a typographical error on this slide. There shouldn't be anything under analysis because none of those numbers right now in Frenchtown, none of those numbers are near the cusp. So where it says potential of one less section overall, I just strike that. So right now we have 495 enrolled at Frenchtown in 25 sections. At Jane Ryan, we have 397 enrolled in 20 sections, but we have two classes near the cusp, so that could go up one or two more sections. At Middlebrook, we have 498 students enrolled in 25 sections. Uh, grade three uh, has been holding at 100 for about a month. But uh, if we get even one more student and don't lose any, that could go up a section. And Tashua is another school right now, like Frenchtown, where they're not on the cusp anywhere. 405 students spread over 20 sections. Now, in summary, the next slide shows everybody all together. Oh, I think I talked about Middlebrook. Uh, if I didn't, that's uh, 498 students at 25 sections. And it could go up one higher. And then Tashua, yeah. 405 for 20. So our total summary is represented there. We have over 2,700 K-5 students coming to Trumbull next year in 139 sections. Now, if you combine all the previous charts, if everything went in one direction, that 139 could go to 137. But if it all cut in the other direction, it might go to 144. So we're monitoring this carefully. Your budget that you adopted, budget for 140. But we talked about how there is some move in uh, reserve for negotiations. Now, if you look at the next slide, in addition to monitoring daily, we are looking at this carefully in terms of the reopening plan. Because you might know that 
In the reopening plan, as revealed by the state, uh, parents, and here's a key word, temporary, who do not send their students to school for a temporary period would get distance learning at home. But the state has not defined temporary. Now, we have also had some parents express interest in homeschool, which is something totally different. That's withdrawing your child from school and, and you do your own school. If that were to happen and we had more students in the homeschool category where they're not getting learning from us and are just, you know, you can pay sometimes to be in a different homeschool alliance and things, that could affect these numbers. So we're monitoring this very carefully. Now the next bullet is key. There are 57 K-5 students in the enrollment process. That's about 2%. That is not a huge number. Um, the enrollment process starts when a parent begins it, right? But we have to verify again residency and age. And residency is monitored carefully because a person needs to demonstrate that the person is entitled to public school in Trumbull. And it, the biggest way you show that is that you live in Trumbull. There are some other ways, but that's the biggest way. So those 57 will move past that page um, once they demonstrate that. So Ms. Vaz in our office does a great job of monitoring that. And some of those 57 won't prove residency, but some will, and they'll be distributed among all those different grades. And so we'll be back again on July 28th to give you a new update. And keep in mind, students leave and they also come. So there's an ebb and flow. And sometimes transfer within town, they move. Uh, also, grade 6 to 12 enrollment, we will update you uh, at the next meeting. Um, in prior years, uh, I would say there's a general concern that uh, the board has not seen grade 6 to 12 numbers early enough to say, wait a minute, those class sizes must be rectified. We can't have math classes of X amount of kids. So we want to provide you that information on July 28th so you have information currently on that. Um, this does relate to the reopening of school, though, and this is then the transition. We did a survey last week. It is not the only survey, but it's the first survey so that we could get some basic information because we already heard from some parents. I do not believe that my child should go back to school under any circumstances. And it's important for our planning to know, well, how many kids are we talking about that might come back? And we know there are some parents unsure, but this gave us kind of initial information. So I want to thank the community. We got over 5,000 responses. That's a 75% response rate, and it's all across the levels, pre-K to grade 12. We asked three basic questions. Here's the first one. And we showed them the State Department plan, very thick plan. But do you intend to send your child back to school? It's not binding, but do you intend? 86% of parents said yes. And interesting, that was basically the same percentage across pre-K-12. You might have predicted it would be higher elementary, lower elementary, no significant difference. We even looked kindergarten versus grade one, versus about the mid 80s of parents said they intend. Now, they could certainly change, but that tells the reopening committee most of the kids are gonna be back in the building and you have to plan for that. If this were 50%, we would have a really different kind of conversation. Now, if you said, no, I don't want my kid to come back, we asked you to explain your reason. So here are the prevalent responses for the board to know. Some people very concerned about safety and cleaning protocols. They said, I'm just not comfortable and it would be safe enough. Some felt that proper social distancing wouldn't be possible. Maybe the halls are so crowded. How will my kids stay three feet away? Masks were interesting. Some parents and guardians felt masks are very important, but I can't trust that other kids will wear it. But other parents said, I don't believe my kids should have to wear a mask. So if that's a requirement, I'm not sending them. Then we had parents of kids with special health needs or that they live in families with somebody with a special health need, a grandparent or a parent or a sibling, and they don't want that health compromised. And then some parents prefer distance learning so much in the spring that they would prefer it now as opposed to going back. So that explains the other 14%. If a parent said, yes, 
we asked two other key questions, transportation and food to help those subcommittees. So do you intend to drive your child to and from school in the fall? A little less than 50% said yes. Now, you could kind of ignore the pre-K. That is skewed a little bit because we don't have most of the tuition paying kids in yet. But that 47% is pretty similar, K-12. I'm going to drive them myself. That's very key information for Ms. Perkins and her committee. And then the last question, do you intend your child to bring his or her own lunch to school? And that was about three quarters said yes. So that's key for Betty and her team to know. Let me say finally, because of the community watching, there will be a more detailed survey coming out. But this gave the reopening committee enough information to start planning. And then we will ask very specific questions. One of them being, do you have a child who physically or for another reason actually can't wear a mask? We want to know that ahead of time so we can properly program. So the reason this is related to the enrollment is that there's moving parts between these things this year that just haven't been true in the past. So superintendent, I believe, and I are very comfortable with where we are with staffing right now. But in two weeks, we'll have more information on all these fronts. And I know you don't want surprises uh, at the end of August or certainly after school starts. So we want all the information in real good time. John, so one final thing. I don't like surprises. Okay. And uh, again, you did a phenomenal job on this. I just want to add one thing. When Jonathan mentioned about the 47% with regard to busing, state requires us to still provide buses all the students. So although we had this survey, and it indicates, well, only 50% are going to need buses, we still have to provide for 100% of our students. Can I ask a question? Sure. Uh, Jonathan, I know residency and age is the real requirement for school, but with everything that's going on, do we have any idea about vaccinations for preschool and kindergarten? The administration and the board has been encouraged by the State Department of Health to be flexible with health and immunization requirements. So uh, actually now, if you register your students starting this week, you get a letter from my office with Lynn Steinberg's uh, information as director of nursing to help, because some of our parents aren't positive, well, where could my child get? Uh, what pediatricians are open? Is that risking my health? And also, uh, the state of Connecticut is providing some free uh, flu vaccines for children to try to encourage that vaccination as widely as possible. So uh, there have been state mandates in the past that if you didn't have a physical in certain grades by June 1st, you couldn't come back. Uh, but the state has asked us to have flexibility with that because we don't want people who are compromised with their health necessarily going out of their houses. Have we gotten, have we gotten any new students yet from the new um, housing over by CES? Yes. Um, that, that, and I think it's on Reservoir Road, is that right? It's right, yeah. Uh, those students, uh, have been coming. We actually had one arrive in mid-March, and uh, we have a board policy that allows us to place students in high that who come from high density um, uh, developments, which is defined by the Planning and Zoning Committee, uh, to be transported to any uh, elementary, middle school. It might not be their neighborhood school. So we looked uh, and talked with those developers, and we looked at our statistics. Those students have been placed at the elementary level at Jane Ryan. And at the middle level at Madison, the, that's the school that Jane Ryan goes to. And these numbers reflect that. Uh, the student who was here in March has been transferred, and the new students are starting at that school. Uh, and that's, uh, that's amenable to everybody. Uh, there will have to be a bus from that location to Jane Ryan and Madison, but that would have been necessary anyway because it's too many students uh, to fit on the bus we already had near there. Just one other question. Uh, the total students presently K-5, is that above or below last year's amount of students? I kept that for you, Jackie. 
Uh, I don't want to just speak on it because it's a close number. Right. Okay. Anyone else with a question? Yeah, Jonathan, it's Scott. I, this may not be a fair question and you might not have the answer off the top of your head, but those percentages of um, the number of families that will um, not use the busing or the number of families that intend to send a lunch with their student, do, do you know how different those percentages are from actual averages from prior years? Like what, what percentage of our students use transportation today? Oh. We're still studying that today. So I think it's going to be at the next update Ralph provides to the board. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, is, it is, I would say, on the transportation rather significantly different. Um, and, and the same from a lunching perspective. But the details on lunches could change, as Ralph said, because if we have to provide in the fall, or if we need to provide, I should say, in the fall, the breakfast and lunches that we did this spring, uh, that might change people's uh, way that they answer. It might, depend, might be a different answer if I'm not having to pay for it. Uh, but we can get that information also. I, I just, well, I have the floor. I'm hearkening back to your your uh, enrollment presentation, I just want to thank you for that presentation, and it's very straightforward um, uh, communication. I've for years I've been com made completely dizzy by the by the old spreadsheet with all the colors and all those numbers and what did they all mean. So that was that was totally clear what you just oh, presented. I couldn't, Thanks. But I couldn't read that one. My eyesight is Yeah, I was like couldn't understand it. Thanks. I would, I would just add um, with Ralph, with what Ralph was saying before about the 47%, we have to still, you know, bus 100%. Perhaps it helps us with the new guidelines with the amount of kids that can be on the bus. Um, so, you know, we might, we might benefit with, with that. At least. And with related resources, for example, students on buses will have to have sanitizer, but it's different for us to plan whether we're going to have 100% of kids needing it versus 50%. All those details to follow. Fingers crossed. More meetings to come. All right. Anyone else have a question? Uh, Chairman, a quick question. Uh, are we going to have, uh, you're suggesting now that no cafeteria will be open when we open in uh, September? Okay. We're not going to provide the free reduced lunches for people? I, I believe they're on the K 5 level, Mike. In talking with both Betty and the elementary principals, likely, and it's not a definitive thing right now, that um, food would have to be eaten by students in their classrooms. So the thought there was not that food wouldn't be provided, but it wouldn't be eaten in the cafeteria, because uh, there's this concept in the reopening of cohorting that you want to keep the same 20 kids uh, kind of together and not mixing with others so that. Mrs. Cinco is really working on, well, how could that be accomplished feeding students in the classrooms? Excuse me, John. Also, if you read the state report, they're suggesting that we use gyms and uh, cafeterias to reduce our numbers in classrooms rather than using them for food. That's a fair point as well. That's a fair point as well. But if, if we're in school more than a certain amount of hours per day, we are obligated to provide lunch, as you say. To oh, yes, I know. And if you're in school, if you're in the gym, how does that affect your uh, physical education program? Sure. I put yeah. classes in there, they have to go through That's right. kind of PE activity. I'm working with the uh, special areas, the art, music, PE, and career and technical education, and across the board, pre-K-12, uh, none of the administrators believe it will be feasible or desirable to have students in the gymnasiums. Uh, that causes a lot of problems, including where to have any kind of physical education or athletic activities. But the cafeterias may be a first line. That's different. Uh, place that's that's the, you have, you know, the floors to right. have to watch. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Anybody else have any questions for Jonathan? Uh, one last question, Madam Chairman. Have we taken time out to measure if I have a class of 24 kids in my third grade? Can I get them all in with distant learning? 24 kids in one room? Have we stopped to measure and taken what? We moving furniture so those desks will be that separate? Or are we talking six feet or three feet? It's elementary and high school and middle school. It is slightly hard to hear you, but I think your question is about the uh, square footage in classrooms. And yes. 
Mr. Mm -hmm. Irwin and Mr. Morello have been touring the schools the past few days from the facilities subcommittee of the reopening. Uh, they've been touring with the head custodian and with the school principal. They've been looking at your typical classrooms, uh, things like square footage and furniture, uh, but also things like your atypical classrooms, like a wood shop or a, a kitchen, a culinary kitchen. And they're coming up with exactly those kind of questions. What furniture can be removed? Uh, what student furniture must be replaced with individual desks, for example, for very young students? Uh, and, uh, and that will be coming out in the, in the final plan that Ralph shares with you all for sure. Yeah. Okay. That's gonna be a problem to fit everybody into the class with 22 or 23 or 24. And even the fact is, when will the teacher take her lunch? Who's been watching the students when the teacher has a 30 minute break? Yes, and I, I want to be clear on that. The expectation would be that the teacher is also able to leave and have lunch, that the teacher wouldn't be monitoring the students. Now that raises a question, who will be monitoring the students? But that yes. is a factual and statutory duty-free lunch period for teachers. So there's no expectation that the teacher would watch the kids for lunch. But the location of the classroom may have to be where the food happens for the kids. Very nice report. And I like the old method. I like to note the size of the classroom. That's why I like that big spreadsheet. It gives you a better idea who's in what class and how class size is important. I like percentages, but they don't give me the whole picture. Thank you, Jonathan. Very nice. Yes, thank you, Jonathan. All right, thank you very much for the report, Jonathan. Okay, our next up is Mr. Cameron, your approval lease purchasing agreement, Bank of America. Uh, good, e good evening, and uh, thank you for giving me a chance to talk about this. Uh, also, thank you for giving us a chance to get together this evening. Small step, but every journey begins with a small step. Thank and you. There's only seven of us, and they did a great job. Uh, during this portion of the agenda, I'm going to ask your approval for a resolution and a memorandum of understanding. Your approval will enable the town to go ahead and refinance the three existing Bank of America leases. These leases came about as a way to finance three separate energy conservation and performance contracting projects. The projects resulted in significant upgrades to the existing school facility. Seven schools received new boilers, pumps, ancillary equipment, and energy management systems. These systems are, will serve those students and the staff well for 25 to 30 years. Photovoltaic arrays have been installed on five schools, and new energy efficient LED lighting has been installed in seven of the nine. The two remaining schools will receive lighting updates this summer. Those are separate from this particular project, and you approve those projects at your June 16th meeting. So, question is Did these projects make any difference? I looked in the 2011-12 energy bills for the Trumbull Board of Ed. We spent $2,509,000. As of June 30th this year, we'd spent $2,189,000, a savings of $320,000 per year. That savings includes payments for the leases. And we are about, after these resolutions pass, we are about to reduce those lease payments by $138,000 per year. So yes, those energy projects have worked. These projects were financed by three leases, which were approved by you, Board of Finance, and the Town Council. Thanks to the good work of Board of Finance member Vinny DiGennaro, we are about to consolidate and refinance these three leases. Vinny has been working on this project since February. He's been working with the encouragement of First Selectman Tesoro and Chairman of the Board of, Board of Finance, Laney McHugh. It's a thankless job. He's had to resolve a lot of details. So publicly, I'd like to acknowledge and thank Vinny for all of his work, for Chairman uh, McHugh and First Selectman Tesoro for their support for this project. It's been tedious and time consuming. But they've done it. You know, they've gotten it through all the approvals that need. Tonight, tonight is the last step. 
We need to approve this project so that we can realize $138,000 a year saving. And we built that savings into our 2021 budget. So the two documents I'm asking you to approve are a resolution. The resolution empowers the superintendent and I to sign any appropriate documents to facilitate this transaction. And a memorandum of understanding, which consolidates three earlier existing memorandums of understanding, which define the roles and responsibility of the town and the Board of Education with respect to these transactions. Anybody have any questions? No, I don't have no. anybody done. I'm going to need a motion for both those. Can we right. do that together? Is that okay? We can do that. I can make that motion. Okay, thank you. So I would like to make a, um, a motion of, for the approval of the lease purchasing agreement from the Bank of America, which includes the resolution piece, which empowers the acting superintendent, Ralph Isagna, and the memorandum of understanding piece, which defines the roles and responsibilities of the town and board in this transaction. I need a second. I'll second that, Scott Kerr. Thank you, Scott Kerr, second. Now, does anyone have a question for Mr. Cameron? No. no? Okay, all in favor, I'm gonna take the vote. Who's proceeding? In favor. Okay, Lucinda Timpanelli in favor, Ken Gallo? I'm in favor. Okay, um, Scott Kerr? Yes, in favor. My board? Yes, in favor. Okay, Jackie Marcel? In favor. Okay, it's unanimous, all in favor. Thank you. Thank you for your hard work on this, Sal. Thank, Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Vinny. Thank Vinny. Thank you. Okay, uh, the superintendent asked me, as, as I was walking in tonight, he said, I want you to make sure you shorten up your remarks because so, you're the last guy on the agenda. Only because these, these, these were re my remarks. But instead. Again, I'm Al Cameron. I'm the interim business manager. And this portion of the agenda, I'm here to present to you today. Now, they were in all your packets. So I'm not going to use them as a visual aid. I'm just going to talk about that. Um, considering the financial journey, some may call it a roller coaster ride that we've been on this year. I am really pleased to be able to talk to you about where we are tonight. Part of my focus since I've been your business manager has been to improve communication regarding Board of Ed finances beyond the general fund, beyond the 106 million appropriation we get from the town, to include reporting on part of the Board of Ed budget paid for by the town from the private school called Fund 009 and it had never been reported on before, to the best of my knowledge. We just started talking about it about three months ago. Um, student activity accounts, state and federal grants, special revenue accounts, school lunch programs, scholarship programs, otherwise known as trust and agency accounts. These are all accounts that you guys are held responsible for. And so it's my belief that every month, you should see how we are performing in those different areas. Having said that, I'm gonna make a liar out of myself because uh, we're reporting on year-to-date results tonight through June 30th. And I have that for the general fund, the million, the 106 million. I have it for the state and federal grants and I have it for the uh, bills that are paid for the non-public schools. I don't have it for a bunch of those other things because we just didn't have enough hours in the day to crunch all those numbers and get all that stuff reported. But still, I am really pleased to talk to you about what happened in the general fund. Things looked pretty bleak when we started in September. I'll never forget my first day, December 13th, and Sean tells me about three o'clock and I'm gonna send out this letter. What's the letter, Sean? I'm gonna send out a spending freeze. Why do we need to do that? Uh-oh. And that's when the fun began. Uh, Sean sent out the spending freeze and we started trying to manage the situation we were in. Sean and I agreed, we came to the number separately, that we could be between 1.2 and $2 million over by the end of the year. And I was really worried about how the spending freeze was gonna work until one day I came to work 
this is a true story. I had no idea this was going to happen. I look in the hall, and who was standing there but Superintendent Isaac? And I worked with him in Brookfield, and I knew the better days were coming. <laughs> I saw him in the hall that day. Uh, and when that friendly freeze that I was worried about, he made it so. He made sure that everybody towed the line on that, and he got great cooperation. He also sort of imposed an informal hiring contract. So as soon as the position became open, he wanted us to make new. Now, there were a couple of situations where he had to make a temporary appointment, but very reluctant. He was interested in doing everything he could to save money. I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge the elephant in the room, Mr. COVID. Mr. COVID came and because of no school, we saved a bunch of money in a number of areas. No spring sports, no daily substitutes, reduced outplacement tuition, reduced transportation for that, those outplacements. No regular student transportation at all, which resulted in a substantial credit that helped our budget this year. Reduce professional development, reduce supplies, on and on and on. Because of the savings that I've just identified, what started as a potential deficit gradually became a modest surplus. But along the way, as we expanded our reporting to beyond the general fund into those other areas that I talked about, we realized, uh-oh, there were some more expenditures in other areas, elementary streams, athletics, tech ed, interdistrict, summer explorations, continuing ed, and school lunch. We identified these, we came to call them legacy shortfalls. And we committed ourselves to trying to find to the greatest extent that we could find savings in the 1920 budget so that we could cover those shortfalls. As we were closing the books, we realized there was enough money in savings to cover the shortfall in elementary strings. That was $204,000. Unfortunately, it wasn't enough to cover a whole bunch of the other. But I am pleased to report that after our preliminary close, and that's what you call what you do on June 30th, we have an available fund balance of 132,446. That means you are in the black. You did not overspend the operating budget. So, so that, that is huge. That is huge. Especially <laughs> Consider where we started from. Yeah, it is. No second mortgage. <laughs> I wish, right. I wish the 132,000 was bigger because it could help solve some of the legacy problems. We have about a $24,000 problem in continuing it, 232,000 in inter district, 134 in tech ec, in, I'm sorry, 232 in tech ec, 134 in summer explorations. But we don't have that flexibility right now. Now there is 132 to the good. And, and this is another part of the of this closing process. As we close the books with $513,000 in open encumbrance or open purchase order. Now that again, that's a tremendous accomplishment. That's less than one half of 1% of your budget. And 118,000 of it is electricity, 110,000 of it is special ed, 67,000 of it is legal fees. So all those things could, those bills could come in at less than what the open purchase order is out there. And when it does, the surplus could grow. Trouble is, I would be remiss if I didn't tell you the storm clouds are gathering. Last week, we got a, an unemployment bill for $40,000. We haven't laid anything off. We are sort of incredulous that we got this bill, but how unemployment works is that you have to pay, the state runs it. You have to pay the state, and then you want to fight the claims along the way, you can fight the claims, but you have to pay the state. So we got that negative 
but we're still substantially in the black and our direction is good. So I just, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the hard work of Peg Brandisi, Sue Ellen Rattigliano, and the many people, Corinne Cannon, and the many people at the schools that helped them work to get all this stuff together. Because everybody's known since we started this thing that you needed the most current information you could have. The community wanted the most current information they could have. Because we, things were looking so bleak for so long. People wanted to have real-time reports. So we really worked hard to make sure you have it. And I need to thank those folks for their extra effort. <clears throat> that is really all I have to say about the general fund. Anybody have any questions about the general fund? All right, does anyone have a question for Mr. Kim? Right back. Right back. I don't have a question. <laughs> oh boy. Now you can see why uh, I'm so impressed with how he's professionalism. There's no question about that. One of the things he mentioned, the $132,000, it'll probably go down as he pointed out. But the board, and I think I mentioned this to you, but I want to remind you, boards of education have, an un, uh, have a balance at the end of the school year could give it back to the town or can ask the town if they can use it for x y and z now and i worked on it and i've already sent a letter to uh vicky to sorrow asking if we can use whatever monies we have i think i put 60 but i'll revise it because this is the official number if we can use that for one of the legacy accounts and i'll point it out to you so that's already in motion when i hear i'll let you know that's important. If they give us money back, it will certainly fill uh, what Al wants to do. Thank you. Thank you, Superintendent. Anyone else have a question for Mr. Cameron? No. No? Okay. okay. I have a couple. I'm, I'm sorry. I have just a couple. I'll, I'll get off quick. Oh, I know it's hot. I don't uh, know why it's so hot here. You need to fix these things. Well, it's, 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 it's fake, it's fake cool there. <laughs> just let me just explain to you. Uh, one, there's one family report that you got to report on, which is the uh, non-public schools that paid services paid for by the town. We're over budget on that. The thing that's driving us over budget is two things. One is budget of property. The other one is uh, there's transportation issues that we are investigating. We may be able to cancel the purchase order, which will bring that one into alignment pretty close. The next one is state and federal grants. We did something that was a little bit different this year. We made sure every last spent cent that was in our federal grants was spent. And we're going to start next year with new grants. So we're a good place there. Uh, if, you, if you look at that report, you'll, the thing that you'll notice is that there is a balance on the report. But the balance is due to uh, Teapot and Head Start, which don't close until fall. And the balance is available to the non-public schools, which don't seem to want to take their money from us. Finally, uh, the other uh, accounts have been finished now, but I didn't have time to get them out by the pre recommendation rules. So I don't really have anything to report to you, except um, the cafeteria is not looking good because of the continued the time that we had to spend paying the people, and no revenue was coming in. I think that the auditor that works, uh, Joe Sentafuli, who works for PKF, is going to have some recommendations about that. And that is all I have. If we have a motion to accept the financial report as presented by the business manager. I need a motion to accept the. Madam Chair, it's Scott Kerr. I'll make a motion that we accept the year to date financial report as presented by Mr. Cameron. Thank you. And I'll, I'll second it. Uh, Marie Petiti seconded. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. Everyone in favor? Let me go through it. Ms. Fatini? In favor. Lucina Timpanelli in favor? I'm in favor. Tim Gallo in favor. Yeah. Scott Kerr? Yes, in favor. Okay. Mike Ward? In favor, yes. Okay. And Jackie Norcell? In favor. Okay. Thank you. That's unanimous in favor. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Cameron, for all your work, hard work this year. We know we had a very difficult year this year. We appreciate all the effort.
We appreciate all the reports that everyone has done. Uh, Dr. Bud, thank you so much. And I want to thank um, our Mr. Chen, Bill Chen, um, Jeff, and Katie, our videographer, and Christina Heffley for having us come in here and do a, an almost real board meeting. And I appreciate your effort in making it both a Zoom meeting and a regular meeting for us, they, except for the air conditioning, which is not working. Something had to not work, of course. Okay, so thank you, everyone. Mr. Ward. Madam Chair, I make the motion that we adjourn. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Aye.